uh, has decided to host uh, millions of uh, Ukrainian refugees, and last not least, it has last summer decided to give uh, Ukraine candidate status for membership in the European Union. So this is certainly impressive, and uh, the high representative of the EU, uh, Josef Borrella, said this is the birth of geopolitical Europe. I have certain doubts in this regard, because in my mind, uh, there were two factors that made this unity possible. Right? Unity, despite the long-standing divisions in the EU when it comes to policy towards Russia. And the two factors were Vladimir Putin and Joe Biden. Vladimir Putin, because his action was so aggressive, so unexcusable, that even the greatest Putin versteher the government that were most supportive of, of Russia in the past had to fall into line because there was simply no way to, to accept uh, this attitude. And the second factor, Joe Biden, was that the U.S. on this issue displayed a, a leadership that was enormously impressive. They assessed the situation correctly, while most European governments did not believe into a sort of full invasion of, of Ukraine, they knew what would happen. And they worked very closely with the Europeans uh, in order to uh, bring together a unified and a strong response. So in a way, it was less the birth of geopolitical Europe, from, but the rebirth of the kind of benevolent US hegemony, at least on a temporary basis. Uh, but now, after 10, year, 10 months of the war, certain cracks in the European Union, uh, unity are opening up. And, uh, and briefly look into the various cracks uh, for the moment. The first one, and by far the most serious one, is that there are different views regarding the ending of the war. Hmm? There are the countries that are closest to Russia, the Baltic states, uh, part of the Nordics, Poland, uh, see there is only one solution, that is the full-fledged, complete defeat of Russia. And the expulsion of Russia from all the occupied territories of uh, Ukraine, including Crimea and the rebel controlled districts in, in the east. Um, they believe that's the only way to make sure that this threat doesn't reoccur. But many other European countries, I think, are more worried about the, the kind of economic uh, and social fallout of the war, uh, the collateral damage, and they're very interested that the war ends as quickly as so they, are, they would like to see a ceasefire, mm -hmm. they would like to see the beginning of negotiations uh, on this issue as, as soon as possible. This split is not very much in the open at the moment. If you look at council conclusions, uh, or if you listen to Borrell, he would always say it's entirely up to the Ukrainians to determine when to negotiate and what to negotiate. But behind the scene, there is, there is really a certain rift opening up. And this became very clear, uh, for instance, when Macron came back from Washington and when he said, uh, that's what I think three weeks ago, that uh, when the negotiations start, we have to give security guarantees to Russia to, to allay the Russian concerns about NATO moving right up to the Russian borders. And there are worries that the weapons will be stationed there that would threaten uh, Russian territory. This statement produced a massive backlash uh, from uh, the Baltic states, from Poland, who felt that uh, a terrorist state, a barbaric terrorist state, shouldn't be given any guarantees whatsoever. And the only thing that is really supposed to be negotiated with this state in the future is war reparations and prosecution of war criminals. So you have a pretty big uh, gap in views uh, on this issue, and this gap also mm -hmm. underlies mm -hmm. other divisions. Uh, another one is really uh, the question of the level of military support. Uh, I think some countries say that everything needs to be given to the UK to ensure a quick victory, early victory, regardless. And, but other countries uh, in the EU uh, want to support uh, Ukraine, but they have also other concerns. One concern is that they want to avoid that uh, Western countries, <coughs> NATO, is directly gets directly involved in the conflict with Russia. That's 
they they strong concern on what that happened. The other concern is that the economist wants to see a situation where the risk of an escalation towards even the nuclear level would become very, very high. Uh, and, and you see this in particular in this long-standing debate on the delivery of modern battle tanks to, uh, to, uh, to Ukraine, of three divisions in the EU. Another division exists really also on sanctions. Now the, the EU is negotiating at the moment the ninth sanction package, but I don't think that we should have high expectations that this will be very meaningful. Probably some more industries will be put on the list, some more oligarchs, some more media companies. But to some extent, uh, <coughs> most of the economic ties to Russia have already been severe. And also, uh, there are, with every sanction, package, bigger divisions inside the EU. You have, uh, again, uh, the Eastern European countries advocating for uh, measures that really, really damage the, the Russian economy quite badly. Uh, but you have concerns, for instance, in, uh, in, in, in Western Europe, that if you, for instance, have an uh, oil price cap that is too low, Poland had demanded $30. That would mean that uh, Russian oil disappears from the world market, and this would drive up prices dramatically and have very severe implications for inflation and other uh, interests. And then you have a particular interest from some countries, like the shipping industry in Cyprus and Greece, that was, uh, it's played a big role in, in shipping uh, Russian oil. And you have Hungary, which is more and more sort of an outlier, uh, which is generally skeptical on sanctions policy. Orban puts uh, posters up on the walls where uh, the sanctions are seen as a rocket that is destroying the, Russian, the Hungarian economy. So this is becoming increasingly uh, difficult. Now, uh, there are two more issues that are massive challenges, or will be more challenges to, to EU unity. Uh, one is uh, reconstruction. I think there is a clear understanding that reconstruction will be a hugely costly endeavor. I think there was a World Bank assessment about 350 billion. In the meantime, I think people expect it to be more than 500 billion. And I think there's an understanding in the EU countries that the EU will have to supply a large part of, of this uh, support. Um, but there are big differences of views on uh, whether this should be financed through collect collective debt along the lines of the reconstruction funds or by individual commitments by member states. Uh, there are different views on how big a leadership role the Commission should take on this, uh, to what extent grants should be used, or to what extent loans. Mm -hmm. So there are big issues that have to be resolved on, on this issue. And finally, the last issue is, uh, is of course, the membership perspective of, of the UK. Last summer, when uh, the EU debated about giving uh, Ukraine the can uh, candidate status, there was a, was a lot of skepticism in the council. Uh, and quite a number of countries felt this was premature and it was a bad idea generally. But the one argument that finally brought everyone to accept this decision was that uh, denying Ukraine the candidate status would be a victory for Vladimir Putin, and nobody wanted to do it. But now, I think. You have a group of countries and the Ukraine itself that are quite ambitious. We see this as a, a near-term perspective for the next uh, couple of three years, three or four years. Uh, there will be a progress report next autumn on, on the situation in the Ukraine. And I would expect when you have the beginning of the discussion on the beginning accession talks. But for a large number of EU governments, uh, kind of EU accession of Ukraine is a very distant perspective. Uh, I think the situation is absolutely not mature for that. There might be sort of a frozen conflict if Ukraine is not able to free all its territory uh, and, and they, they are not ready for moving towards the accession process at the moment. Now, uh, all these divisions, like how relevant are they? If, if you look at yesterday's statement by the chief said uh, that was very solid. It was very strong, clear language and, and very unified. Of course, some EU countries and, and the EU institutions have 
Tata, to set the Tata for this common mission. I think that, that two risks in this regard that could make these divisions uh, a serious problem. One is the economic uh, fallout of the war. Uh, I think uh, now the expectation is that the EU will get through the winter relatively in a good place, but there are some concerns that refilling the storage facilities, the gas storage facilities next uh, year might be a big problem and, and the collateral damage from the war could become could become uh, much greater. And if there are sort of then uh, enormous economic and social problems, then certainly uh, the views on the war would be, uh, will change. This will definitely affect it. The second factor is the US leadership. I think as long as uh, the Biden administration is uh, remaining on course and exerts very strong and determined leadership on this issue, we might not have to worry so much. But of course, there is also in the US uh, sort of a beginning of a, of a division. You've uh, heard about General Milley, who said not so long ago that uh, Ukraine had some success in recent weeks, and they should use the lull of fighting of the winter months to negotiate an end of the war. Uh, he was quickly corrected by the State Department and the White House. but. <laughs> the general is the highest military officer of the U.S., and his views are certainly not, not irrelevant. And then there are Republican uh, politicians who say uh, this is vastly unfair. The U.S. is spending much too much. The commitment is much too strong, and, and the EU is doing not, not enough. Uh, you have the old burden-sharing debate coming back. And finally, there are a number of people in the U.S. who feel that the the real problem for the U.S. is the rivalry with China, and ultimately Ukraine is just a distraction, and, and there is a need to sort of refocus U.S. policy on what the real, real challenge is. So we cannot be totally certain uh, that the U.S. commitment will remain at the level where it is at the moment. So altogether, and I'm coming to the end, what I see is that we have a war of attrition and a war of attrition, not just with drones, artillery, and uh, missiles in, on the ground in Ukraine, but also a war of attrition uh, on a political, economic, and psychological level. Uh, I think uh, there are a few doubts in the resilience and the determination of the Ukrainians to uh, fight this to the end uh, successfully. And I'm also, I also personally believe that Russia is a fairly robust actor. You have an authoritarian regime that controls all channels of, of information, that punishes any kind of dissent relentlessly uh, through massive repression. Um, and you have a population that has still some memories of hard life and probably is quite resilient in this regard. So as far as Western Europe is concerned, I think you can have some question marks in this regard. I think obviously uh, we've been uh, we're in a way possibly less robust uh, in our attitude. And I think the, more, the longer the war uh, goes on, uh, the more we will need sort of real political leadership to ensure uh, that this kind of positive unity and determination in responding to Russian aggression is maintained. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan, that uh, uh, thorough um, overview of the challenges uh, that have been posed. Clearly, we've chosen this topic of the European response to the Russian aggression because it also defines the position of Europe and the European Union in the world. Stefan mentioned, of course, the US-China uh, rivalry competition um, and uh, the G G2 world. So, um, Roberto. Let's hear your thoughts. Uh, thanks a lot. Is it working? No. I'd use this one here. Okay, now? Yes. Thanks, uh, Ivan. And thanks to the organizers uh, and EI for hosting us. Um, yes, I'll keep my remarks very general in the sense that I've been struck by a number of uh, specific dimensions of the EU and European reaction to, to the war, to the invasion, many of which, of course, Stefan already has alluded to. Uh, but I think some of these uh, issues have a long-term significance that goes even beyond all the concerns 
that you have just uh, expressed and that I share, to be honest. So I see, I very much agree uh, with the glass half empty that you have described. But let's try to, to look at the half full uh, part of the, of the glass, uh, keeping in mind that we have both. So uh, full disclosure. I think, first of all, the reaction of most European countries, and especially of the EU as a whole, uh, has been to, to treat the crisis as an attack on a basic principle of international relations and European security and stability, not just as the invasion uh, you know, by Russia of a former Soviet uh, uh, republic, uh, which wasn't to be taken for granted at the very beginning. Remember what happened in 2014. Uh, we treat it essentially as a local issue with specific grievances behind it and we try to quickly forget about it. After 2014, uh, most European countries increased their energy dependence on Russia, deliberately, by design, <coughs> and massively in some cases. Uh, so this was a big change of tack, I think. Um, uh, the second point that strikes me is that uh, we have quickly realized collectively as Europeans, I think, not just within NATO, which I'll get to in a moment, but as Europeans, especially within the EU, that we will need to think more when you look at the future uh, in terms of deterrence, because we have failed to deter Russia in this case. So whatever happens with the current crisis, the next step will be how do we ensure that this doesn't happen again? Because otherwise, all the efforts and all the money and all the, 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 the sacrifices, especially by the Ukrainians, uh, but everything that's been done uh, will have been, I wouldn't say useless, but only partly useful. Because it could happen again and again and again. If the situation goes back, you know, I, I have many friends and colleagues sometimes saying, well, it is a maximalist position to go back to, uh, let's say, February 23. And I keep telling them, no, that would be a disaster. It's not a, a, you know, an end state that we can accept because it means that we can go back to uh, February 24 at any given time, which is the next invasion from Crimea, from anywhere, from the border, from Belarus. Uh, and that's clearly uh, foolish after we have made all the efforts that have been described. So we have a deterrence problem looking into the future. And it, it's going to be complicated because most of the effort we have to go through the Ukrainians. So it's a matter of how do you ensure that Ukraine can defend itself? Because regardless of the uh, pace of possible NATO and EU uh, accession, this will not solve the problem immediately by itself, in any case, whatever we do. Uh, so it's a matter of making sure that the Ukrainians are willing and able to defend themselves much better than in, in, 2014, in uh, 2014 and, of course, uh, a few months ago. Um, then uh, another aspect that's been mentioned already, it's, it's a NATO issue. Uh, I absolutely agree, it's b the real difference has been the Biden administration. Uh, you know, probably we all uh, had this sort of uh, thought experiment in our head, what would have happened with Trump in the White House? Yeah. Uh, I have no idea, I don't want to think about it, but <coughs> it would have been very different. So, of course, it depends on who is the leader at any given point. And the Biden administration has treated the crisis in a way that, uh, in which U.S. leadership is indispensable, and it remains indispensable, again, I agree with that assessment, but it makes it possible for the others to cooperate in many different ways, you know, within NATO, through armaments, through money, through dealing with the immigration, crisis, I mean helping these people who would not be migrants, by the way, uh, by their own will, uh, who are forced migrants essentially, and, and the numbers are staggering because it's a big deal, for, especially for some of the countries more exposed. Um, but certainly the, the NATO framework has been revitalized mostly thanks to the Biden administration, which is a good thing, again, also thinking of my own obsession with deterrence. Uh, because a, a NATO that, un that better understands uh, that we need to do more uh, regardless of enlargement, regardless of Ukrainian accession one day, uh, is a good thing. Um, then of course, and that's the other element that is more of a question, 
from my own perspectives, is whether the Europeans collectively uh, have really grasped the meaning of uh, the global context. Because the US is looking at this in a global context, uh, not just as a matter of principle, you know, the invasion of a neighboring country, but also, of course, in terms of their own, I mean, American interests elsewhere. And, and the Chinese are doing the same, by the way. I mean, in Beijing, they're watching what happens in Ukraine very carefully. For example, one of the good things about this crisis is that they now understand what would happen to them if they try to invade Taiwan, which would be an incredible disaster for, for China. It would be an incredible, massive disaster from a number of perspectives. Uh, it would be like Normandy from an operational point of view. Uh, not as easy as invading Ukraine. And, and of course, uh, the United States and Japan uh, would immediately come to the aid of Taiwan, not you know, after a few weeks thinking about it and maybe, maybe not, G7 statements and so on. It would be immediate. Uh, so they understand the operational and the political diplomatic challenges much and an economic uh, backlash much better than they did before. Uh, I'm saying this because I think that's the way in which they look at the crisis in Washington. Again, Stefan has mentioned some of that. They have a wider perspective, inevitably, because of their own interests and their own uh, outlook, so to say. So they, they look at Ukraine and I think China almost immediately. Uh, we do that a little less, uh, and that's understandable too. But here I see a problem for NATO looking into the future and NATO-EU relations, because I think what uh, people expect from the Europeans in Washington is not and I keep saying this almost obsessively since a few months ago, no one would like, I think, the Europeans to go and defend the Strait of Taiwan or the Malacca Strait. That's not what they're expecting. They would like for us to be able to defend the Suez Canal, our own straits. I mean, take care of the Bosphorus, for example, a bit better. Uh, I wouldn't say Gibraltar because that's more controversial uh, historically. But at least to take care of what's much closer to home not necessarily alone, but perhaps with American help, but clearly in a way that would be much more European. So that's something that I think is a bit, little bit uh, uh, hazy uh, in, in the European perception of what's going on. Uh, so NATO is alive again, alive and kicking, but it will have to become more European when it comes to dealing with things like the Mediterranean, uh, the Balkans, Turkey, in, in many ways, although it's a member state, of course, uh, and even Russia, even Russia looking ahead. Uh, and I'm not sure we're ready for that. Um, uh, then on, on EU cohesion, uh, there's nothing I, I can add. I mean, it's been remarkable on one hand, but of course it's challenged on a number of specific issues. And that's, I think, just natural. It's, it's, a, it's a healthy debate to have. I mean, to what extent I'm willing to do more, in what way, uh, that's inevitable. It's a democratic debate. So again, I'm trying to look at the glass half full, even with all the problems that, that have been mentioned. I would just add one component to that, again, which is a question perhaps for the future. Um, I wonder whether uh, in, in Brussels we should become more aware, in Brussels I mean collectively, uh, not just the, the individual member states, of something that happened in 2013-14, which we probably like to forget. I mean, the first invasion of Ukraine did not happen because of NATO enlargement, uh, which didn't happen, NATO enlargement, I mean, not in the way the Russians thought. Maybe, yes, there was something about the 2008 uh, uh, summit, uh, the, the NATO summit, but that, I, I think, was extremely indirect in causing the 2014 invasion. What really mattered to Putin uh, was, of course, the association agreement. And that's a completely EU decision. And, and what, I'm, what I think is the EU should reassess that decision, which was, I think, the right decision to make, but think about it in geopolitical terms. I remember almost laughing uh, by myself when I, the, the first time that uh, von der Leyen mentioned the, the uh, geopolitical commission, because I thought, well, that's what we did in 2014. That was extremely geopolitical, but we didn't like it. We didn't know it. We didn't know it, exactly. It was like an afterthought. Oh, by the way, we're actually, uh, you know, getting the Russians very angry. It's only an association agreement. Well, it's an existential threat to Russia, exactly because Putin is so uh, specifically uh, uh, linked uh, to a certain view of his own power structure. I mean, his own vertical of power, whatever it's called. 
so it may be unique to Putin. It may be that Russia in 10 years will be very different, but for now, that was an existential threat. I mean, an association agreement. Uh, but we have to, take, to, to think about it next time, because that's where the EU becomes geopolitical. Uh, and it doesn't have to be military, but it's still a very, a very geopolitical issue, a very, very much a security uh, issue. Then I have one um, specific thought, a, a specific uh, criticism uh, of, of EU uh, jargon, I would say, uh, but there's a reason behind it. I mean, int intellectual reason, so to say. I'm always a bit uh, worried when I hear all this talk about sovereignty, energy sovereignty, technological sovereignty, whatever sovereignty, uh, which is usually initiated by the French, normally, and then the others follow because, I mean, uh, okay, we understand the, the, the logic behind it. To make the EU more resilient to some extent also means making it more sovereign, yes, in a way. But I would be a bit more careful in using that term because it's not just a matter of being sovereign. What does it mean to be technologically sovereign? I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. Is the U.S. technologically sovereign? Not really. But we wouldn't say the U.S. is not a sovereign country. So, I, I, I don't know, Max Weber wouldn't like this discussion, I think. I mean, sovereignty is a political science <coughs> concept and we should probably leave it there. Uh, autonomy is slightly better. It's slightly more politically usable, uh, provided we, we actually mean it. So my advice would be, let's focus on being more effective, more resilient, that's fine, uh, more willing and able to do things together, and then we'll become more sovereign by, you know, as a matter of fact. But declaring that you want to become more sovereign, I think, is a little bit putting the, you know, the cart and the horse in the wrong place vis-a-vis uh, -vis each other. Uh, last point that, that I think is, uh, that actually we were discussing this with Ricardo Alcar a few minutes ago before we started, uh, that's been uh, sort of uh, bothering me since the beginning of this, of the invasion, uh, is, is the media side of things. Uh, let's say the fake news, the type of indirect uh, influence that Russia and others, of course, can exercise on our de democratic debates. Of course, this is relevant especially to a a, a, a collective body like the EU because, as we know, making decisions, even on small things, take, takes a long time, it's complicated, it's, it's, it's a big effort. So anything that complicates the decision-making process and, the, and how we manage consensus can be a serious problem. So I understand the, the concern with uh, all the forms of uh, influence uh, that, that gets into our, our, our veins, in a sense, you know, into our system. Uh, but I would have one big caveat here. I'm always surprised when I hear the argument made this way. Okay, fake news affect public opinion. Well, usually not. It seems to me that the real, that the key here is a professional media. Because, for example, who is it that tells us that some piece of news has become viral? It's a professional media. You wouldn't know it from Facebook, from Twitter. Something goes viral when the professional media tells you that something has gone viral. So they're the echo chamber. Then who decides who the expert opinions, you know, who are the experts and who goes on TV shows? And the TV shows, the talk shows, are crucial to what happens. You know, most people I know don't get their, their opinions from Facebook. They look for reinforcement on Facebook or whatever is your preferred uh, social media outlet. Uh, so I would really focus on a professional media because th those are the filters that connect uh, whatever happens outside, whatever gets disseminated outside, and public opinion. Um, and I wonder whether uh, even at the EU level we should be a, more, a bit more careful with having a more serious debate with the professional journalists who sometimes I think don't really realize how uh, impactful their decisions can be. Uh, because I don't see that, that direct influence uh, being, being so, so common, so widespread. It's mostly filtered, indirect. Uh, and again, the expert opinion, of course, has been a serious problem, at least in Italy. I don't know about the other, the other countries, but here it's been quite clear that there's been a huge um, uh, battleground on trying to analyze what was going on in a matter that it's not even objective, it's reasonable, because in some cases it wasn't even reasonable. Uh, and then, of course, you can have different, 
different opinions. Uh, very final point on uh, what could happen next. So I won't get into the, the how do we solve all these tensions within, within the EU. But one thing I believe is, is important to, to keep in mind. Um, this is one of those instances, I mean, the, the, the invasion of Ukraine, in which I think the, the EU collectively as a whole uh, is learning more lessons. Uh, so whatever happens with the, with the level of cohesion, the, the endurance, let's say, uh, the resilience of our consensus, which sometimes is a little thin uh, or uncertain or with, with caveats and so on, I think we are learning lessons that we, we, should, we should keep with us. Um, you know, we, we will not be surprised again by a number of things if we, if we learn the lessons. And I think that is a process that's ongoing in Brussels and is also ongoing in, in the national, I mean, in, the, in all the capitals and within the, the, the national leaderships. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Roberto. And yeah. Indeed, it's uh, been a very steep uh, learning curve. Uh, and a rapid one. Uh, thank you also for bringing up the point about the association agreement. I think many of us who sort of uh, delve into these problems really understood that this was how you pull someone into the European fold. And um, it was not surprising to see the reaction of Russia to that. But as our, our dear friend uh, and colleague Ivan Krastev says, uh, for Putin, it was the Orange Revolution back in 2004 that was his 9-11. And that's then led to the Munich Security Conference speech in 2007 where he basically opened a book about what he was going to do and then the invasion of Georgia, of course, in 2008. So there's been an, a sort of escalation. And I think we were all uh, completely complacent and off guard. And, and of course, 2014 was a, a very meager reaction uh, to what, in fact, was the announcement of something bigger. But of course, with hindsight, we're all smarter. Um, Dimitar, uh, you, you are at Oxford, but you're also uh, someone who is from Turkey. Uh, so maybe you can also bring in that angle. Is Turkey being helpful or not in the European response as a European country as well? Uh, I think that's the only one that's safe. <laughs> it's Stefan's. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not really from Turkey, but I, I studied Turkey. But, <laughs> but again, my ancestry has something to do with the Ottoman Empire, so uh, I, 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 take your, I take your point uh, in a friendly manner. <coughs> I'm conscious that we are running out of time and we want to give some space for questions and answers, so I'll be really brief and I want to make four points. The first point is about economic power, the second one uh, military power. Then I want to talk about small and medium sized countries in this situation with the war. And finally a note on multipolarity that both Stefan and especially Roberto touch upon. So one of the lessons from the war is that uh, economic power has limited utility, right? We spent as Europeans three decades building interdependence with, with Russia. Uh, we can see it in the energy trade, and Italy is no stranger uh, to this business relationship. Um, and that was supposed to be an incentive for the Russian leadership to engage in a productive relationship with the EU. Um, nothing works that way, right? Uh, the fact that uh, we have this trading investment uh, and other ties didn't prevent Putin from invading countries in the name of restoring Russian primacy or restoring some sort of a um, centrality of, of Russia in its own region and correcting the historical injustices that he sees. And equally, uh, going back to what Stefan said, um, the economic sanctions might not be the full answer. I mean, they inflict pain on Russia, but it won't change uh, the behavior of the Kremlin in the short term and also the intel costs for those who sanctions uh, as well. And that's why Putin believes that he has staying power, that the Russian society can endure and those uh, support um, consumers in Western Europe, in Germany, in Italy and what have you, who eventually demand that their, government, uh, their governments make a U-turn. So, so much uh, on economic power. 
But having said that, and that's my second point, how about military power? Well, military power doesn't work either for a variety of reasons. When military power is tied to a flawed political strategy, then its utility goes to the drain. Uh, Putin um, thought that by sending troops to Ukraine, he will be able to affect regime change. Um, there was this fantasy world that uh, you, Russia could emulate the shock and awe strategy that U.S. interventions performed in Iraq uh, and Afghanistan. And nothing of the sort happened because um, the whole operation, or special military operation, as it were, it was based on flawed political assumptions. Um, that's one. Secondly, uh, military power is not only about quantity, uh, how many tanks Russia have, or how many uh, nuclear warheads. It's about quality. Uh, how much exactly you deploy, at what moment, where in a country the size of Ukraine, and what are the political and diplomatic steps tied to the deployment uh, of, of military power. So, yeah, I mean, as a deterrent, um, I mean, I definitely agree with Roberto. It has value, and that's one of the lessons learned. And that's, by the way, a lesson learned already in 2014 because NATO deployed forward presence uh, back then in Poland and the Baltic states. And now, of course, NATO is present in Romania, in my country. And by the way, Italy is leading the NATO deployment uh, in Bulgaria. That's something that sh should be known. And also in Hungary. Um, so at that level, yes, but if you want to use your military strength as a compelling force to make other governments concede to your uh, demands, it becomes really tricky. Uh, that's one of the, the issues going forward. Now, small states or medium-sized states. Nobody believed that Ukraine could put up a fight. Um, the vision that Russia had about European politics, but let's be honest, not just Russia, mm -hmm. other big players as well, was that European security is about the big guys in the room. Uh, it's Russia, it's France as a military power, it's the UK, maybe Germany, with all caveats about uh, German military power. This is how Russia envisioned European politics from the times of Yugoslavia, when they set up the contract group. Um, and that was also how business was done. Uh, Georgia, remember Sarkozy going uh, to uh, mediate a peace deal. Well, well, one thing we discover, first of all, is that institutions matter and they empower smaller players. And the reason that the association agreement became a thing was because Poland and Sweden champion the Eastern Partnership. And then the EU acquired this geopolitical dimension, increasingly and Russia came to realize that the EU matters. It's not just about NATO and the US, uh, US power, but also about Brussels and about uh, other players in the decision-making process. Now with the war, not only Ukraine is at the forefront, but also countries that have skin in the game. Poland would be one example. <laughs> Uh, if you see the level of military expenditure in Poland, um, the way it has hosted Ukrainian, um, Ukrainian citizens, and that's something that goes even before the war, of course, with, with uh, Ukrainian migration. The Baltic countries driving the debate, who'd have expected that before? Um, it's complicated because they're countervailing interests and uh, it's an ongoing debate now. Stefan was very good in kind of outlining the, the various division lines uh, in the EU Council, uh, but credit where credit is due. Those guys matter, Warsaw matters, uh, Tallinn matters, uh, and Hungary matters as well. Uh, Orban has been the only uh, EU leader to visit Moscow since the beginning of the war. He went there because of Gorbachev's uh, funeral, but of course that's, that was a prefix. Um, by the way, uh, CR told the uh, foreign minister was in Sochi uh, last month, if I'm not mistaken. So those players play a crucial role, and actually Turkey comes into this rubric as well. Um, and this is a nice segue into my fourth point about multipolarity. There is no doubt about it. This is a war that happens in conditions uh, very different 
in structural terms than other conflicts we've seen over the past three decades in the sense that uh, U.S. primacy is waning, and that's something that Putin banked upon um, when he launched the invasion. Um, also in the sense that whatever actions Western players embark upon, there is always the calculus what it means in the grander scheme of things. Um, U.S. is uh, supporting uh, the Europeans because the implications for Taiwan, and uh, Roberto was very good in highlighting this. Um, when the EU designed the oil sanctions, there was an internal debate about setting the cap at a level that won't disrupt the international market uh, in crude oil. So $60 was a compromise. If you ask the Estonians, they'll probably set it at 25. <laughs> um, um, so the fact that you operate in a global marketplace with a very fractured and often contradicting um, uh, interests, uh, impacts on European strategy. Same goes for the, another discussion about natural gas. So you wants to deploy this side of its economic, uh, geoeconomic muscle. But there are lots of questions about, um, in the Commission, but also in Germany, if you uh, put the cap very low, what that will mean in terms of prices, since China will be on the market very soon, and uh, in Asia there will be competition. And so on and so forth. So the multilateral, the multipolar setting matters increasingly. Russia wants to peddle a narrative to the global south about anti colonial struggles. I mean, I'm not sure how much that impacts. And of course, Turkey, coming back to what Ivan gave me as a, as a task, uh, it's been playing both sides, trying to maximize its geopolitical position. And that's something that I'm sure some Western governments welcome because they need another channel. Um, the U.S. Um, um, uh, is back-channeling through Ankara. Uh, William Burns, who used to be the head of Carnegie, um, and I'm sure Stefan had dealings with him, and now he's the CIA director, met with uh, Sergei Nerishkin uh, in, um, in, in Ankara, and, and so on and so forth. So Turkey uh, is the swing actor uh, in the situation. But here's a caveat, and that's my concluding thought here. Uh, despite this multipolarity, um, order in Europe is essentially bipolar. It's the West versus Russia. Um, Chinese actions, Indian actions, even Turkey won't affect the outcome here. It's a contest between the West uh, and, and Russia, essentially. Um, this whole thing that uh, the global South doesn't care and won't intervene uh, also means that um, we are alone uh, in this region. So there won't be the Chinese <coughs> coming and playing the power broker, uh, much less anybody else. So this brings me back to the beginning of uh, the discussion and also what other speakers have put forward as a question and we might discuss it. Uh, and that is the transatlantic connection. Um, so uh, EU and the West have been united in sustaining this one pole of uh, the geopolitical competition. But is, is that the case going forward? Um, can we count on the U.S. to be there longer term? And I, I'm afraid I don't have an answer, but uh, it's something that we'll be um, debating over the long term, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dimitar. And obviously, uh, some of you know, but I highly recommend Dimitar's book on Turkey and Erdogan, that's yeah. why I made him in Turk suddenly. <laughs> um, uh, how the mind works. Um, I think we have a pretty comprehensive uh, view of, of the issues. A number of questions, of course, arise from both the half full and, and the half empty, as, as Roberto put it. It also begs the question of the future of European military and deterrence. You know, is Europe now going to learn the lesson and really start beefing up its defenses and again as was said how does that correlate with NATO and where is the pooling and sharing going to have to happen uh, not to mention the whole energy issue but uh, since we have um, I, I'll, I'll give us about 10, 10 to 15 minutes maximum so I'll open the floor to your questions so let's take a round of questions 
right there. And please do identify yourself. And will we have a microphone uh, going around the room? Felix, is there a microphone? No, because we're, we're taping it, so we need a microphone to go around. Sorry for that. Um, hello, thank you for a very, very insightful discussion. I'm Katerina Piscikova, a professor of international relations here in Italy. And I wanted to link um, to uh, Roberto's uh, comments about deterrence. I think there were uh, two elements in what you were discussing. The one, uh, one element is um, about European security. So deterrence as, as securing the EU itself. And it has, of course, as you mentioned, many dimensions the vulnerability, the interdependence, uh, hybrid threats, and, and as well as the military dimension. But then the other one, as you mentioned, has to do with regional security, and that is securing the territory that is not the EU's, and that obviously is Ukraine. And so my question is, inspired by Dimitar's uh, uh, phrase that uh, military might is not really uh, useful without political strategy, so um, going forward, uh, making sure that there is um, secure Ukraine, it can't be just about giving more weapons, right? So what kind of security guarantees you think, or all of you actually think, might be uh, put in place? How do we take that issue forward to make sure indeed that the, uh, the region is secured? Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Giorgio Gover, I'm, I'm an economist, I'm a former head of research at the Bank of Italy and a member of YAI. Now, one question that puzzles me very much, and, and you alluded to, uh, the first speaker, has to do with sanctions, you know, the power, the power of, of, of sanctions. And, uh, I mean, I don't know actually if they are now already, you know, exposed uh, quantitative and qualitative analysis of the effects of sanctions on the on the Russian economy where they are impactful. But say generally, you know, in the theory of sanctions, you know, going back to the 30s, the, the idea, I mean, rather trivial, but still interesting is that, you know, sanctions, I mean, what matters very much is the, the nature of the country that is hit by sanctions. And if it, if it is, you know, a dictatorship or, or, or a democracy, and it seems to me, uh, from what you actually said, that the fact that, you know, Russian is a, a tyranny in a, in an undemocratic state uh, makes for the case that, that sanctions are not uh, will not really be, be 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 effective in changing you know the, the behavior of of consumers, producers, and public opinion in the country. But you know, this is just a question. I mean, I have no I have no clues actually. Uh, perhaps there are some analysis done by the World Bank or the IMF. I'm, I don't really know. Thank you. You can pass the microphone up front here. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Ricardo Alcaro. I'm head of research here at YAI. Um, my question concerns the uh, risk or the eventuality some of you have raised about the U.S. decreasing its commitment to Europe. This is something we've been hearing for like forever. It, it hasn't actually happened. We've have. We've had uh, uh, actual proof, strong evidence of the country in these last years. But I do see uh, where these concerns uh, come from. And I would like to challenge you a bit on being more specific about what realistically you think, what form realistically you think such a decreased uh, commitment can take. Any more questions? Uh, one back there, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm Cecilia Capanna. I'm a journalist uh, for other news, Roberto Savio. And uh, we speak mostly about mu multilateralism. And here I haven't heard anything about, for, for instance, as a deterrent and as a um, what, what is so, we are all struck by this war, right? Uh, by this invasion. How can we do? Uh, what can we do to avoid that this happens again? Actually, this is the same question 
the entire world asked itself after the Second World War, and the United Nations were born because of this. And actually, United Nations and multilateralism are failing and failed horribly, and this is something maybe that ye, uh, ye, Europe, the European Union, could question since in the uh, five members of permanent council there is France and there is not Europe. There is uh, US, there is not, there is Russia, and just for one veto, nothing can pass. And this, this is something that the, the entire world, since we are now in global, in a global view, and we are citizens of the world, we should maybe think about, as Europeans, something multilateral uh, like this, refunding something in this direction with dialogue in order to avoid the military <laughs> necessity and all we are living right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. If there are uh, just one more question here. Thank you. Uh, well, I have, I maybe, I'm Stefano Silvestri, a former president of the IEI. Uh, the, the, my question, uh, my problem is that uh, while I am more optimist uh, of the vision of the European unity, because uh, while there were many differences anyway among, uh, among European countries before the war, what the surprising thing is the unity in front of the attack. The fact that there are different visions about the future, that's quite normal. The problem doesn't, doesn't uh, change the, 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 the fact that the reactions remain quite unitarian. Uh, it is true that uh, there has been an influence, uh, definite influence apart from Putin, <laughs> of Biden. But, however, I think that uh, we are today confronting a problem which is quite difficult, that is to say, I, it is very difficult to imagine how to end this war. Uh, and uh, this uh, is, is becoming a real problem. Do we want to eliminate Russia? Uh, do, we, do we want to, to, to go for, 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 for Russia crumbling now? Do we want to have a compromise that maybe the Ukrainian cannot accept. I mean, that is something that, uh, uh, it is, that, then, that is very difficult and in which the, um, the, 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 uh, the American leadership might be difficult too. Because if it is true that Trump uh, was a very difficult uh, unilateralist, Biden is also a relatively difficult uh, uh, binary man. Uh, which uh, see, we see the word uh, basically divided between good and bad. And uh, uh, a compromise between good and bad is not so easy uh, to, 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 <laughs> to find. Uh, so I think that what we really should do is think more about the future of European security. How do we want to organize it? Uh, what kind of structures and uh, guarantees should be put into a new system of European security because clearly it has to be different from the past. At least the past has not worked. And uh, uh, what kind of reaction time, what kind of deterrence uh, is, uh, uh, by the way, deterrence in regional terms uh, can be based simply on the threat of use of nuclear weapons? I doubt it. We have seen that it doesn't work. So it should be more active. An active deterrence is a very risky thing that should be think, thought about strategically. So I think that is the real problem which, is, uh, uh, which, which we have in the longer term. In the short term, it's easy. We continue to help Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're, we'll, sorry? Yeah, go ahead. Quickly, yeah, I just want to uh, add, I'm Silvio Gulli, I'm an international manager who worked for a long time uh, for, our, for an important oil company and uh, for many years having to do with this part of the world also. I have a simple question which is coming up uh, as a prosecution of what he said. 
and it is simply what do you think uh, should be for the future because this is an issue which I think is very important uh, which way we we should take uh, in influencing the internal uh, Russian political evolution because uh, I mean everything else which is uh, you mentioned is very very important speaking about the global evolution speaking about the role of Europe which uh, sometimes I see very weak actually but it's a positive weakness because this this is a uh, the West part of the world, which has its own weakness coming from democracies. Uh, somebody mentioned that uh, this part of the world instead, on the other side of the fourth wall, it's very much resilient and Putin knows about that. So, but I come back to my question. Uh, apart from the military uh, situation which we have now and which is impacting and it's important, it's very important, do you have any ideas how we can influence the internal evolution, political evolution, of a country which is not, of course, it's clearly not a democracy. Because that's the point, I think, which will drive, it will be the most important driver for the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, back to the panel, and Tim, are you might be? Yeah, maybe so to pick up on the last question, that, yeah. yeah, I, I think, under the best of circumstances, Europe and the West in general will have very little impact on the domestic situation in Russia. Uh, we have to be honest about it and, and realistic. Uh, except that maybe, and this connects to the question about the impact of the sanctions, uh, we basically facilitate the brain drain that is happening. Russia is a very atypical state uh, because on the one hand it's a rentier state, reliant on natural resources, oil and gas, uh, and other minerals. But on the other hand, it has, traditionally has had a highly educated workforce and middle class. Now, because of the sanctions and the pariah status Russia is acquiring, this is a segment of the population invested into globalization that is suffering the most. And they're probably the most likely uh, segment to emigrate and to seek refuge, not just in the West, but also in places like Turkey and the rest of uh, the CAS. So I think it, the EU should facilitate them coming because we all concerns about their disruptive impact and I, I understand some governments being skeptical. But I think safe haven for those Russians, irrespective of their political views, might be a good idea helping also uh, liberal media. I mean, there's this whole story for those of you who have followed about Latvia and TV Rain. Um, but again, despite the safe heaven for economic or political reasons, we have to be really s sort of uh, humble about what we can achieve longer term. And I think sanctions work in the sense that they won't change the calculus uh, on Putin's side or his close associates, like put people like Patrushev. I mean, they, they, they won't, just because EU uh, prevented fertilizer export, uh, reconsider their policies. But longer term, uh, Russia is uh, confined to low growth, low development, no innovation, stuck into this cycle of rentier economy. So it's not very bright, uh, and whatever regime emerges, and even if Putin stays in power, it's the Brezhnev era, once again. And if energy prices and fossil fuels just go out of the picture because of energy transition, uh, I mean, the future is not bright for Russia. It might not be good for the EU, but certainly Russia is not going to, to a better. Uh, and very briefly, um, the pullout and the, what, what can happen um, on the transatlantic front. I mean, with Trump, we saw some uh, glimpses of a negative scenario. At, the, at worst, it probably entail um, withdrawal from NATO. It might not happen, and you're absolutely right that evidence, even in the Trump period, is very much clearly on the side that those institutions and commitments have proven resilient. Uh, but, I mean, there is a scenario, and it has to do with the Republican Party, the way it evolves. Um, views of unilateralism, of isolationism, of offshore balancing uh, will be playing. Uh, but yeah, the, the jury is still not out. One last thing, multilateralism. 
I mean, suffered the blow, but then again, credit where credit is due. Uh, Secretary General Gutierrez played a role in negotiating the grain deal. Um, so given our low expectations vis-a-vis -vis the UN, they haven't done that bad of a job. And maybe going forward, if there is a ceasefire of sorts, uh, there might be a peacekeeping mission. But of course, this is a pie in the sky right now. OK, terrific. Uh, Roberto, uh, we'll yeah, use this we'll use famous Stefan microphone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I will pick up some of the questions. Many of them, I think, are connected um, in a way. Uh, deterrence. I, I have a very broad view of deterrence. It's not just military, as I think someone said in, the, in one of the interventions. I mean, it's a very broad concept. Uh, I think we are doing deterrence right now. I mean, deterrence is about the future. It, was, it, it is about what others expect of you if something happens. And we are, I think, sending a very strong message to everybody, including the Chinese, again, to, to take it to the extreme, uh, you know, systemic rivals and all that. We're telling them uh, if something this big happens again, we are willing and able to do the same again, which is there will be sanctions, there will be a pariah state for Russia. Let's not forget that that's not irrelevant. I mean, Putin has built his own uh, his entire political career uh, based on a pact with his people, especially with the people who benefited more from his political regime, which is a minority of, of, of the Russian people. And the pact is broken. It is destroyed because they have no access to what they want right now. They have to buy it, uh, paying it much, much more. They're into recession. It's a big recession in Russia. We have no idea about the details, I think. None of us really know because some of these things are very, it's a gray area between you know, economic facts and perceptions and so on. But this is deterrence in a way, what we're doing. And it's completely, this is, has nothing to do with weapons per se. Then there's the, our ability to react, including through military help, support, intelligence and all that. For example, we haven't mentioned intelligence. We can provide intelligence to a country that's, that's invaded in a way that has changed the situation on the ground in three weeks, in a month. Uh, Ukraine was almost desperate when the invasion happened. And now it's, on the, it's been on the offensive since September. This is because of weapons, uh, diplomatic support, practical economic support, and intelligence. Because we have it, and the Russians don't have it. It's not as good as ours. Mostly American, granted, but it's still part of the picture. So deterrence is very broad, and I think when we look forward, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it will never be foolproof. There is no way to make it completely uh, uh, foolproof, but it's still much better than what we had before. Uh, looking at the EU specifically, well, the EU, as far as I'm concerned, simply did not have any deterrence policy uh, so far. I think now we're beginning to think of something like that, because as I said, NATO is not enough. NATO will have to become more European anyway if we wanted to survive until the next crisis uh, because the, the Americans have been telling us so since the, I don't know, Clinton years, perhaps. So it's a long, long time. Um, uh, on another element, for example, that's part of, in a way, of a deterrence effect, sending messages, is what uh, has been mentioned already, the G7, the latest uh, yesterday's. Uh, I was actually a bit surprised by the strength of that uh, communique. Of course, it's a statement. It's a set of words. It's a declaratory policy. But it's, it was very strong. And that also, let's not forget, uh, the multilateral structures. Uh, they've been weakened. They've been in crisis for a long time. The ones we know from the past, certainly. The UN Security Council, of course, is paralyzed because of Russia. China, to some extent, but certainly because of Russia. Uh, the G20 is paralyzed, but the G7 is not. And it's been working very well to the extent that, of course, it represents just seven countries. But it's still a, you know, a multilateral body. And let's not forget, Japan is in there. Japan is a message to China. You know, so these things have uh, certain connections that sometimes we, we underestimate. Uh, then on the, on the end game, and Stefano Silvestri is right, I think. N no one knows exactly how to end this war. Uh, I think you're right. If you look at the map, if you look at the numbers, if you look at the, 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 the military territorial issues, it's extremely complicated. Uh, I think one 
one, uh, I was about to say certainty, one likelihood is that the current um, uh, Russian leadership is, uh, is an unacceptable counterpart. I think we will not negotiate with Putin, Lavrov, and, and that little team. Exactly, exactly. But that, that's, I think that's the real point. I mean, they're not <coughs> a counterpart because they're not willing to negotiate. So that they're off the table. So whatever happens is going to be with Russia, with a kind of Russia that will be partly different. Then, of course, whether there's regime change is very, we have to be very cautious. I agree with uh, Dimitar. But on the other hand, let's not forget that political change, when it happens, even very deep, profound political change, is almost never linear. Remember, Gorbachev, all of a sudden, he, that, that was supposed to be an orderly, s the gradual change from exactly the same leadership. Then all of a sudden it becomes a revolution. I mean, a self-inflicted revolution, not coming from the streets, coming from the top. Uh, so sometimes that happens. We have no idea how exactly, but we can affect it from the outside. On sanctions, I'm more <coughs> optimistic over the l medium to long term, even in a country like Russia because of the indirect effects. For example, I think it was a, clearly an own goal for Putin to declare the partial mobilization. Essentially, he created a diaspora all of a sudden, a new diaspora, because the previous one was essentially a business diaspora. I mean, a sort of rich people uh, 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 flow. Now he created a little bit of a new diaspora, and he, at some point he may pay a price for that. Um, the, the, the very last point on US, the US role, uh, Ricardo, um, I think one, one thing we have to be uh, more effective uh, in, in doing is uh, making sure that uh, in the United States, especially when there's a, an administration like this one, they should see more of a European effort to actually uh, share the burden in a much more intelligent way. What we're doing is not so much uh, not enough. It's not, it's not very smart. I mean, seen from Washington, if you, uh, it's often so, when you look at something from the outside, uh, it's very clear. I mean, we're wasting a huge amount of money in military terms. And we know why, because we're duplicating. Uh, and it's still so, after 35 years, or I don't know, I think we were kids when this debate started. Uh, I'm older than you, but I was a kid. So <laughs> you were more of a kid. You were a younger kid. Uh, very last point on this, on this one. Um, the, uh, there, there's a change in, in the U.S. attitude toward Europe that goes even beyond Europe. And I think it has to do with the Mediterranean, North Africa, Middle East in a very wide sense. I think it's not really perceived very clearly so far. But it seems to me that we should become, we as Europeans, the EU, the European component of NATO, whatever, should become more aware of what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, I mean, the United States, since the Obama years, including with Trump to some extent, and certainly with Biden now, have been changing their, the structure of their alliances. I mean, th they no longer trust Egypt, they no longer trust the Saudis, they no longer trust Israel. To me, it's a pretty big deal, it's a pretty big change. They've been, well, they're scaling down on, on, on all of these alliances, and, and I think it's something we should take note. So that's part of our challenge to become better transatlantic uh, partners. Stefan, finally, uh, and if you could keep it short, yeah, because very we're quickly, severely uh, over time. Just uh, a short uh, word on sanctions. I think there have been many academic studies about the effectiveness of sanctions, and I think the studies say they work sometimes, but not very often. But one has to take into account much of the sanctions that we decide in the EU, etc., are not really meant to modify the behavior of the target country. They are signaling sanctions, basically, sort of political action. It's different, of course, with comprehensive sanctions regime as we did on Libya, Syria, and now on Russia. And here, as regarding Russia, I think most people will say that the financial sanctions have not worked very well. This freezing of the bank reserves uh, have not had a major impact because Russia has continues to have a massive income from the energy exports. So the financial dimension has not been pretty useless. The technological dimension has been extremely effective. I think the car production plummeted. Uh, I think two-thirds of all uh, Russian civilian aircraft is Western imports. They will run out of uh, spare parts, and uh, that will cripple the whole just aviation industry. And as, as Dimitar has said, uh, the sanctions had the effect of driving hundreds of thousands of their best people uh, into exile. And, and that will have a severe impact on, on, on the Russian economy going forward. Uh, 
final remark on how to end the war and what will happen after the war. I, I talked to a very brilliant Carnegie colleague from Russia, and he says, well, there are two scenarios for the future of Russia. One is Iran, basically. The other one, that's the good one, and the bad one is North Korea. <laughs> and if you, if you talk to Baltic colleagues, they would say this is just fine. But if you talk to Macron, who says, who would think this is a disaster? We need a security order in Europe that has a place uh, for Russia. And I think on this issue there are really deep divisions on the EU. And they will probably, I would say, not manifest themselves very soon. Because I, it's, it will be interesting to see how we actually operationally move towards the uh, end of the conflict. Basically, the EU position is up to the Ukraine to determine when to negotiate and what about to negotiate. But de facto, this is also determined by the military support uh, uh, Ukraine gets. So basically, particularly the US has a big say on this matter. So I think the point will come when probably the US and the UK have to, to come to an understanding on the scenario for, for moving to a different stage of the conflict. Uh, and it will, I would think that the Europeans will have divided views on this issue, but ultimately I would believe that the US point of view uh, together in close coordination with Ukraine will be uh, the decisive one. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, I apologize once again for uh, sliding off the time schedule. Uh, we will have a next panel after a coffee break that I suggest takes 15 minutes. So I would ask you to promptly come back, but please join me in thanking our panelists for their. <laughs> Great, really good.
morning, what, it's, yeah. a, it's 11. <laughs> it was a long night yesterday, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Zoran Nechev. I'm a senior researcher at the Institute for Democracy. There's a think tank organization in North Macedonia, and I'm also Europe's Futures uh, Fellow since, um, since last year. Um, the second panel of the day is Geopolitics of Europe. Is the EU getting it right? So you will see it's very, very, uh, you know, it coined in a very nice way that we're talking about geopolitics of Europe, but how EU is getting it right. So we have, uh, as we don't have a lot of time, and we had made a, uh, an agreement with the, with the moderator on the next panel that we have to squeeze the discussion, so we all have time to speak. Um, we will go with one round kind of an impulse speeches and then we will immediately open the, the, the floor for discussion. Uh, we have four fabulous and very distinguished speakers. Uh, I will start on my left, uh, Isabel Ioannidis, non-resident senior associate fellow at uh, ELIAMEP, the Hellenic Foundation for European uh, and Foreign Policy. Rosa Balfour, director of Carnegie Europe. On my right is Valbona Zeneli, Professor of National Security Studies and Chair of Strategic Engagement at the George Marshall European Center for Security Studies in Garmisch, Germany. And last but not least, the, the, the host of the co-host of today's event, uh, Ricardo Caro from Research Coordinator and Head of Global Actors Program at YAI. Um, so we put a lot of thinking in the title, so I will immediately open because there is a lot of discussion about geopolitics in Europe, and I think wherever it comes, there is a different understanding of how geopolitically Europe needs to be. So instead of asking a very specific question, I would like each of the panelists just to say and provide an, uh, a first like kind of impulse of what uh, uh, geopolitical Europe is, and is Europe really doing it right or wrong, how it can fix? Because since the, since the 1970s, the EU handled each and every major shift in international power through enlargement. It, it countered Europe's loss of empire by integrating UK, Ireland, Denmark, and Iceland, addressed the third wave of democratization by expanding to Spain, Portugal, and Greece, met the end of global uh, bipolarity by including Austria, Sweden, and Finland, and finally it embraced a Europe whole and free with enlargement in Eastern Europe. So each and every time the EU built its own territory, but it never provoked other major power. So rather than following a classic geopolitical logic of size, power, and competition, the EU's past enlargement were done to achieve stability through a technical process of market expansion and policy transfer. Although the return of power politics to Europe has left the EU bulky, directionless, and vulnerable, it is again with Ukraine and also Moldova and hopefully Georgia, it is again turning back to further enlargement. So, Rosa, we will start with you. How would you approach and how would you answer this, this the question of the panel? Um, I have to say, can you hear me? Yeah. Maybe I should. Can you hear me now? Is this working? Okay, I have to say, I mean, I usually, no. no. Is this on now? Okay, this is on, yeah. I don't know what that was. So, um, I mean, I usually don't like to start with semantics, but it really does, you know, depends on what we mean by geopolitics. I mean, if you look it up in the dictionary, um, it's about, it's, you know, it's rooted in realist interpretations of international politics. Um, it's uh, dependent on having a unitary actor that is capable uh, both in terms of decision making and in terms of capabilities, um, assets, to conduct 
a uh, rational uh, foreign policy based on um, um, fixed, you know, on determined interests. If that is the definition, then the EU doesn't really fit the bill. I mean, it's not a unitary actor for, start, for starters and doesn't have very clear interests. So when uh, von der Leyen says we need to have, you know, build a geopolitical commission or uh, Josep Borrell says, you know, we need to speak the language of power, this is a geopolitical awakening, it's a little bit odd coming from an organization <coughs> and uh, that has actually tried to counter geopolitics uh, through a more systemic approach to international relations. So in that sense, there is there's a bit of an oddity. However, you know, with all this proliferation of use of the term geopolitical, then maybe we need to understand what are we talking about. So if we're talking about uh, the EU beginning to engage with, you know, hard power, um, there are elements of it. I think the panel that we... Um, um, the, the earlier panel actually described quite well the ways in which uh, the EU is doing this. If we look at it from the point of view of how others are seeing the EU, again, the previous panel mentioned um, how um, EU action is viewed in Russia, then, okay, then if we want to use this term, fine. Personally, I prefer not to. Personally, what I prefer to look at is, A, the EU as a systemic power and how it tries to shape the environment, B, how the EU tries to equip itself internally to make it to make to ensure that it can act externally, um, and three, how the EU marries several components in this. And here I've moved to I, you know I just want to say two things about enlargement. Um, the whole enlargement process of the past and. Uh, one assumes of the future, we'll see how that goes, and we probably will talk about it during this panel, has been not just about expanding territorially. It hasn't been just about um, increasing its size or its power, mm, which would be the sort of geopolitical approach. Um, it's also been about transforming societies and polities into functioning uh, markets and into democracies. And this is, this is in the interest of the EU. It's not just a lofty ambition. It's in the interest of the EU because the EU functions because of its um, economic power. That's its main strength. Um, and it functions to the degree to which it can actually be a flourishing democracy. And we're seeing how difficult it is for the EU to reach consensus around how to approach the Russian invasion of Ukraine because of it, also because of its democratic failings within, because the problem is Hungary. So the, these things need to be looked at um, in a connected way and not just in a sort of classical realist way, which is the sort of language of geopolitics. So I would say um, that the question is, you know, to what extent is the EU as a system getting it right, rather than to what extent is the EU able to act geopolitically if by geopolitically we intend the sort of classical definition that you'll find in the dictionary of international relations. Okay, so I'll continue from that and I'm glad I picked a, a different angle because that's always the danger and we haven't really uh, you know, uh, talked about how we would approach the topic. But I'll, I'll also build on what was said on in the first panel, which I think the first panel is more about the EU being a, a firefighter, about how it can, uh, you know, deal with crisis, which is obviously a necessity. But when I look at uh, is Europe getting it right regarding geopolitics, then I personally I think about the EU project more globally. Um, how is it going to deal with the future systemically, as Rosa said? So, you know, then um, I, I'll start from a, a study that I had uh, worked on with uh, consultants when I was uh, in the European Commission already 12 years ago. There was a study on foresight in 2013 that had very much predicted what the uh, foresaw what the, the world would look like today. And a lot of the geopolitical challenges that we're dealing with today 
not obviously the specific uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine, but the bigger questions, um, the rise of authoritarianism, for example, across the world, uh, with it, um, the rise of China's and Russia's authoritarianism and what kind of relationship we would need to have with them, uh, how this would uh, spread to certain aspiring members, let's say Serbia, for example. These were questions that were already there. We're talking about almost 10 years ago, right? Mm, and then a kind of a Western systemic uh, war between, on the one side, well, the West globally defined, let's say, on the other, Russia, China, which has intensified clearly over the years, um, the hybrid wars, um, the weaponization of energy, which we have seen increasingly, uh, and which has really, the war in Ukraine has revealed its uh, vulnerabilities, Europe's vulnerabilities, um, the geopolitics of food, which again has come even more to the fore with uh, Russia's invasion, and then climate change, the climate crisis. Um, so I think dealing with geopolitics is also about making the right political decision, having the courage to make the right political decision. I think today um, it's not that the EU is not able to learn. It is able to learn from crisis. Some uh, mm -hmm. academics have talked about failing forward. Um, so you learn from a crisis, but then you're not, you're only dealing with the crisis in front of you, you're not dealing with the systemic problem. So obviously along the road you miss crucial elements that you should be learning about. And this is how you sometimes have unintended consequences. <coughs> but over the years I think uh, the EU has learned, has you know, improved its learning capacities, it's, it's even learning faster and reacting faster as we see with uh, the aggression against Russia. But then if we look at these specific four elements that I mentioned, the rise of authoritarianism, if we were going to look at this, I think uh, we have developed mechanisms, but we still don't have the political will to actually apply them. Look at what's going on with Hungary. If we look at um, the systemic rivalry in 2019, the EU's formula for dealing with China was partner, competitor, rival, but now clearly we should say that we're mostly dealing with competitor, rival, partner. Um, if we look at uh, the weaponization of energy, yes, we have found new partners. Some of them are more in our realm, let's say normative realm, so Norway and the United States. The United States remains a really expensive choice for us, but then if we look at the new actors that uh, are going to be on the global scene for different, uh, you know, for example, for wind energy, we're looking more at Morocco, the Gulf countries, Egypt. Um, China will remain an important partner if we deal with, uh, you know, uh, rare earth. So, you know, we're still going to be dealing with partners that are outside our normative uh, world. So I think in a way we are very much repeating some of the same mistakes. And if we look at how the geopolitics of food was uh, dealt with, I would say uh, at the technical level, certainly the Commission has dealt with it. It created the solidarity link, for example, for the grains to be uh, transferred from Ukraine to the rest of Europe. But when you look at how politically what role the EU played in negotiating uh, the, the terms of the agreement, well, it was a big absent, it was Turkey that, that was there. And for the climate crisis, of course, we know the climate crisis has been around for at least 20 years if you look at Africa, but it's only made uh, the EU agenda lately because it's only now that we are experiencing uh, mostly. And we see that um, Europe is warming up faster than the rest of, of the world, so now it's becoming a priority. So I think we're still in the firefighting mood, and I don't think that's how you deal effectively uh, with long-term geopolitical uh, challenges.
Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to follow also what Rosa and Isabel uh, were talking about Europe as a geopolitical actor. I think what we need to uh, have in mind is that it's not just uh, the war in Ukraine that has shattered entirely you know, the security of the European continent. I think uh, the security, um, the European security architecture was based on three main pillars which was receiving security from the United States, mainly through the payments that the United States has done to NATO, always more than 50%, 70% of NATO's defense budget. Cheap energy from Russia, and we saw that this was one of the main consequences of the war in Ukraine. And then the third point that we're not discussing much, which is cheap markets and cheap products from, uh, so cheap products and big markets in China. So we have this, all this you know, security paradigm of Europe has been shattered. And so we have to look at from all this perspective on the way forward. So we had in the last few years two consecutive black swan events in Europe. We had the pandemic uh, and uh, also the war in, in uh, the brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine. And so these events, I think, need to, uh, should bring a complete reevaluation of Europe as it stands as a geopolitical actor in the world, but also most importantly, has to do with the collective attitudes that the EU has towards partnership. And, and Isabel was also you know, talking about that. So what the partnerships of the European Union will look like in the future. Um, the pandemic crisis and its, um, its disastrous negative consequences for the European Union and also Russian uh, war in Ukraine, which is entirely uh, uh, man-made, uh, have made clear uh, the European Union's vulnerabilities when it comes to um, uh, supply chains. That's very important also continuing in the future, but also uh, energy dependence. Um, so we have to rethink also when it comes to the European Union the system of economic interdependence, uh, which was established uh, you know, with the good framework uh, and the good you know, will uh, of, of the West, both the United States and uh, the European Union, to create a thriving international marketplace while taking advantage of the global division of, of labor. Uh, and so what happened is that uh, advanced countries transferred uh, uh, the t technology, so it's mainly about you know, technological uh, also independence uh, of Europe, uh, to um, manufacturing powerhouses such as, such as China. And so the entire system uh, overlooked a one, point, a one single point of failure that we saw it was China during, during the pandemic. And fast forward into 22, a, a war in European soil that, um, as I mentioned, was entirely uh, man-made, uh, that has caused not only a humanitarian disaster, but also economic disaster. Uh, in the case of Ukraine, it was mentioned also in the first panel, it's besides the lives that have been lost and the tragedies in the country, uh, Ukraine uh, IMF predicts uh, a decline in economic growth rate of 35 percent. It was in 2014, it was 10 percent uh, with the invasion of Crimea uh, with the, and, and uh, the eastern, uh, eastern, eastern part of Ukraine. Now, um, we, you know, I think what is important then in the future is to increase economic and energy resilience. Now, Chancellor Scholz and, and Germany talks about a Zeitenwende, which I believe that this Zeitenwende is not only about, you know, Russia, but it has to be all considering all these three elements. Um, I think that the war has unlocked uh, more progress in the European Union security policy uh, in a few months that has done in the last few years. So, you know, we have to accept that. Uh, the European Union has shown a unity and resolve that really at least Russia did not think this was coming uh, from the European Union because we talk of the war in 2022, but the war in Ukraine has started back in 2014. And actually, it was the lack of resolve, I think, of the European Union that brought us in 20, 24 Feb February 2022. 
so what we're seeing across Europe um, is you know, Germany that has pledged to reach 2% of the uh, defense budget of the GDP. Uh, allocating an additional 100 billion for um, as a, a special defense fund, um, EU's incredible unity in harsh sanctions towards Russia, um, and the important steps that have been taken in increasing energy dependency. We know that that's going to be very expensive for Europe in the short term, but in long term, this is actually in you know in the framework of the plans that Europe had. In, when it comes to the green agenda and also increasing dependency. Um, EU has welcomed uh, European, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, refugees uh, and also you know, we'll have two new countries that will become NATO members in the future. So a lot has happened in Europe in the last few months. Uh, however, on, as my last point will be that unfortunately um, Although you know we, we talk a lot about geopolitical Europe, um, there is a gap between, uh, in terms of actions, between um, between the narrative and actions that should be taken much more quicker. However, we have to accept that a lot has happened in in Europe in just in the last few months. And I'll stop here. Does it work? Yes, it does. So, <clears throat> um, geopolitics is uh, an increasingly frequent common term, and uh, I myself use it um, ever more often, but if I stop and think about it, I, I'm not entirely sure what, what, it, what it actually means. I know it is about power politics, or it, it does entail a, a good degree of power politics logic inside it. So I will just take it from there and look at uh, uh, where the EU is in terms of its uh, capacity to play power politics. And mm, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that sure it is in such a good place. I think that both the individual European countries and the EU as such uh, have been uh, weakened by this war, uh, strategically speaking. Uh, they are in a worse position than they were before the war for a number of reasons, even, uh, even if one uh, takes out the, 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 the whole costs that the war is, is causing. Uh, I'm just talking about the uh, strategic ability of uh, EU member states and the EU as such uh, to play on the international stage uh, autonomously or more autonomously. Um, so yes, that would be my first, my, 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 my first uh, point. The second point concerns, I mean, le concerns the actual impact of the war on the EU's uh, um, on the EU's ability to project uh, influence or power <clears throat> abroad, and um, on that aspect too, I I, I don't see uh, much of a of a progress. But I want to be more specific because the, the, the picture is not that bad entirely, especially if we look in the, in the if we take a long-term perspective. So first of all, um, the EU is not is not a unitary actor, as as Rosa was saying, and this is a point which is not emphasized enough when people talk about the EU. The EU is a system, especially when it comes to foreign policy. It's a system comprising institutions, common institutions, and the member states. So if you look at the, at the, at the whole uh, war response <clears throat> from the point of view of the member states, you're going to see that the member states have been able to play uh, a pretty effectively a geopolitical game in the sense that they have been able to uh, use all the levers they had built over the years in, uh, in order to create some foreign policy leverage to uh, resist um, <coughs> Russia's onslaught on Ukraine and, and, and deal with the implications both on the energy and the economic side, 
and also to put forward some punitive actions and uh, military assistance to, to Ukraine. If, he, if, we, if we look at the uh, whole list of things the EU member states have done so far, you're going to see that they have used indeed different, I mean, they have acted on different levels depending on what the best options uh, was at hand, options they had built uh, over, the, uh, over the, 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 their own history, recent or less recent. So, for instance, in terms of military protection, of course, the lever they used uh, hasn't been uh, the EU, but, but NATO. And in terms of arms delivery, the relationship with the United States inside NATO, but also outside of it, has been fundamental because uh, it is from the United States that most of the weapons that have uh, turned the, 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 um, uh, the course of the war have come from. Um, in terms of energy, both subsidies and uh, uh, supplies, alternative supplies to Russia, uh, member states have acted mostly on a national basis and that, has, and that has been problematic, not from the point of view of the individual member states, but from the point of view of the, of the, of the EU. But again, the EU is sort of a, I mean, it's destined to, to suffer from a, a degree of schizophrenia uh, uh, until it, it becomes a, a federal state, which uh, will probably never happen. So. From the point of view of, of individual member states, they have used whatever national leverage they had, whatever le national uh, lever they had, in order to um, alleviate the, the impact of of the war, uh, and especially of uh, rising energy prices on the on, on, on domestic households, and also have been acting quite effectively in 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 in, in terms of searching alternative supplies. They have acted separately, there hasn't been much of a coordination, but the results, I mean, if you had told me uh, in February, at the end of February, look, uh, eight, nine, nine months from now, uh, Germany and Italy will have reduced the energy dependence of Russia to the level they have so far, I would have probably said that that would be the best case scenario. Well, uh, <coughs> a best case scenario has for once uh, materialized. In terms of assistance to Ukraine, non-military assistance to Ukraine, or actually also military assistance, but here the military component of the assistance uh, um, is relatively limited. In terms of financial assistance to Ukraine, in terms of punitive actions against Russia, and in terms of um, a, a broader political uh, a strategy to uh, keep up uh, Ukraine's uh, determination uh, to fight. Well, um, in all these respects, it, the EU has been the level at which the member states have acted. Uh, sanctions uh, in terms of, punity, of punitive actions have been the, the, the most, uh, I mean, the toughest ones, but they are not the only ones. Let's not forget that there have been, there have been an, an, a number of other restrictions adopted by the EU, including, you know, closing of the airspace and, and so on. <coughs> Visa restrictions, I mean, these, uh, these are, these are uh, pretty, significant, uh, pretty significant measures. Uh, military, I mean, assistance to Ukraine. I mean, I've just read that the, the 18 billion package, uh, loan package has been, uh, has been adopted, has been approved. Um, and in terms of how to give, how to, to give Ukraine, I mean, how to strengthen Ukraine's uh, determination to fight and, and, and give it a perspective that uh, could uh, fuel its uh, determination to fight over the years. I mean, the, the, the decision to give it a membership pr prospect as, uh, uh, was clearly crucial, and of course, it is by definition a new thing. So from the point of view of the member states, uh, the geopolitical game um, has been played, I, I think, almost to the best of their capabilities. There is very little that the member states could have done more uh, um, um, given the situation they were in, in, in February 2018. Of course, they, the, 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 the one thing they could have done they could have done more concerns their, their, their uh, um, ability to integrate further at the EU level or at least to establish uh, um, more structural forms of cooperation. Uh, the, the, the reality is, however, that so far, uh, 
however effective or impressive uh, the EU response to the war has been, it, it remains uh, an effective or an impressive emergency uh, action. Um, there, isn't, there hasn't been really uh, a long-term perspective that we can see from whatever the EU and the members, from whatever, from whatever the EU has, has uh, uh, decided so far, and and uh, and yet uh, the, the 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 war has laid bare specific needs. Uh, well, it's not that it has laid bare, but it has it has uh, made it even more clear than than it was before that for the EU as such to, became, uh, to become a more influential uh, foreign policy uh, player, um, there, there, there are certain needs that will be, that will be, uh, that will need, I mean, that will have to be somehow um, addressed. Um, and I'm not sure the member states will have the capacity to do that, but let me just list them one by one very, quick, very quickly. The EU will need to generate an impressive amount of financial resources in the next few years, uh, starting from now, to face the consequences of the war on their own economy, to finance the reconstruction of Ukraine, and to fund the enlargement rounds, not just to Ukraine, but to the Balkans too. And, and all that uh, will require an incredibly amount, an incredibly big amount, large amount of money, and the member states, as their capacity to generate financial resources stands now are utterly incapable of doing that. So they will need to act on, on, on various levels. One level is the EU. And uh, I, I sincerely don't think how they can do that without another shot at common borrowing. Actually, perhaps even the establishment of a European sovereign fund uh, um, uh, dedicated to, to for instance, financing enlargement, including the reconstruction of Ukraine. I mean, uh, I'm not an economist, so uh, I, I don't want to go into the details, but I, I do know that unless the EU does something on this front, its capacity to, to, to be a geopolitical uh, actor will, will, will not increase, will actually uh, be decreasing. Well, let's assume that my magic wand has limits in the sense that it can affect things, but only things that are realistic, okay? That the EU could do, but you really need some political will to do that. So, uh, and the two fronts on which the uh, member states can actually progress, I think uh, uh, economic, uh, economic integration in terms of the ability to generate common resources, along the way of the, uh, uh, along the, I mean, along the pattern of the next generation EU uh, mechanism, and the second is energy, both in terms of uh, generate, I mean, of integrating further energy grids, uh, creating uh, binding commit commitments to energy, through intra-EU energy transfers, and uh, coordinating uh, uh, energy, foreign energy purchases, and of course, re reviewing uh, EU industrial policy in terms of uh, stimulating uh, green technology. Well, <clears throat> uh, I know that we will discuss also the Western Balkans. So um, I think that 
you know, the EU has been, um, you know, overlooking the importance, the geostrategic importance of the Western Balkans. And it looks like, you know, the war in Ukraine kind of, you know, was a wake-up call for the European Union. But as I mentioned, the war had been there for a long time, since 2014. So uh, it was to be expected. And, you know, talking to Ukrainians, which made it clear to European leaders, is that um, it was not, you know, if Russia was going to invade. It was just the question when they were going for a full-scale invasion. So the problems were there. Uh, so, um, two things, uh, integration, fast integration of the Balkans into the European Union for, um, for their geopolitical importance, uh, and also um, um, independence, finding ways to be independent from China when it comes to supply chains. Supply chains. So, of course, I would say boosting the European sovereignty and definitely going beyond uh, strategic autonomy and boosting our military uh, capabilities, which I think, okay, since 2016 we have moved along quite a bit, but. Uh, as was said by two of the <coughs> panelists here, a lot of it depends on the member states. And even if you look at the latest uh, uh, developments and reports of the EDA, of the European Defense Agency, they clearly show that member states, when they, they do not use cooperation, working on joint defense projects is still not their preferred option. And this needs to be kind of a consciousness that we will first work as Europeans and then look for other, uh, other partners, and al also definitely leapfrogging uh, on the twin transition, green and, and, uh, and technological. And why? Because uh, I think it's also important in doing this to, to reduce our dependency on the United States. Um, and not forget that not so long ago, we had uh, across the Atlantic a partner that we could not work with. So now, okay, we have uh, President Biden, and it's uh, it's a good cooperation. But you know, the next elections are not so far away, and we cannot continue to be continue to be dependent on them. Um, and a second thing I think would be to um, capitalize on our EU consensus experience. So. On the one hand, the EU has shown its uh, limits as far as its nature is concerned. I don't think we can go on with it, you know, uh, consensus building uh, for foreign policy, for example. Maybe we do need to, to move to q and <coughs> But at the same time, we have this uh, experience of building consensus and it's something that we could use to uh, create partnerships with, with other uh, middle powers. I'm also questioning whether the EU will remain really a global power at, you know, in, the, in the future. Maybe we need to uh, start thinking about you know, where is the EU's place uh, in 20 years from now? What, what kind of power will we have? and how we will negotiate our partnerships with, with other middle powers, for example. And in that, I think the, the Franco-German relationship, which has been an engine, will remain an engine. So it's really important to, to build on that, regardless of uh, the quacks that have been uh, lately showing, showing up.
<clears throat> okay, look, let, me, let me put it, okay, let me, let me put it this way. I think if you're, I mean, there are two levels. One is the sort of wider European level and the, the other is the international level. So on the wider European level, for Europe to succeed and have a future, it needs to think systemically about what it can do. That means marrying economics with politics, with security, and certainly, and both COVID and the war provide opportunities to accelerate the green transition and the digital transition. And that, if that is the way forward, then Europe can have, uh, have a future. And we're talking about a wider Europe. So I include Ukraine, I include the Balkans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, where does that put Europe on the global stage? Because then you have alternative dynamics. Now, European leaders like talking about multipolarity, but the big trend is towards a bifurcation of global politics between US and Russia. And this is putting increasing pressure on Europeans, but also on other countries in other parts of, you know, in, 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 on the globe. And I think Europe, the EU, has not done very well on the global stage in terms of reaching out to third countries, reaching out to um, the global south in particular. Um, and I think with the war, there is an increasing constraint on Europe's ability to be autonomous, actually. So I'm not entirely convinced that the idea of European sovereignty is what um, Europe should strive for, because it might be an ambition that cannot be pursued. Um, ultimately, um, and we talked about this in the previous panel, the US provided the leadership. Um, ultimately, we are technologically dependent on a space that is shaped by the US more so than by Europe because Europe has failed in the past 15 years to focus, failed to focus on innovation, failed to focus on digital economy, failed to build a capitals market union, failed to address all the sort of long um, um, uh, crises um, until, you know, until recently. The wake-up call came very late. And um, so that is the space Europe is in. It's not necessarily, you know, I would argue, yes, of course we need to be more independent of the United States, more capable of taking certain initiatives, but I'm not sure Europe is in that place at the moment. And on security, um, I think NATO is, is the, the, the big actor. And it, that's, that's the reality, whether we like it or not, it's, it's enlarging. I think paradoxically, the whole war was started on a Russian pretext that it was against NATO expansion. Ukraine itself said, okay, we're gonna abandon the objective of joining NATO and join the EU instead. I think paradoxically, perhaps in, in a year's time, we'll be talking about NATO accession, uh, sorry, Ukraine accession to NATO. So, so I, I think the, you know, the, the players have changed a bit on the global stage. Um, nonetheless, the regional, and this goes back you know, 20 years ago. Should Europe be a regional power or a global power? And there were all these discussions, remember? We talked about it before the EU global strategy. So yeah, about 10 years ago, there was all this discussion, should it be a regional power? I think the EU failed miserably. That was a strategic failure in the Balkans not to take that region more seriously. I think from 2013 onwards, when the Brussels Agreement was reached over Serbia Kosovo, thereafter, it's been a downhill path. Um, and we're now paying the cost of you know, a decade in which the EU is not taking responsibility for itself and for its neighborhood. We're paying for it. So there are constraints as to what we can do on the global, on the global front. Having said this, you know, I do like to think about opportunities as well, and there are, but they really have to be focused on marrying what the EU can do, where it is strong, and that's economics, it is investing on digital and green transition, and it is bringing in as many countries and partners in this process as possible, which means paying for it as well. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Silvestri. Uh, just, uh, I think we should remember that power politics, as far as geopolitics or geopolitics, 
was not a requirement for the European Union. On the contrary, it was, it was and still is juridically, a responsibility of the, the, the member state nationally. The problem uh, uh, is that the, problem, the new problem, which has been perceived by the member states, is that to, to defend their own national interests, they need to produce more capabilities than those that they are able to produce. And so the, the fact is that they need a European power policy to defend their own uh, interests. Now, that it is not necessarily a requirement for success, but I think that there is a, a, a positive element in it that today, now, we need uh, practically a, a defensive policy, and it is easier to, uh, to agree on defense than on offense or projection of forces because there we have to make much more complex calculations and choices. So there may be an uh, an hope, and, but I think that what the European Union can do is not so much to become abruptly uh, a, 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 a geopolitical actor, as, been, as has been said, but to give to the possibility, the means, to the possibility of an agreement among the members to uh, uh, act uh, better in the, in, in, in the, in the present uh, international the me the means are of course the, the economic financial means, the energy, the, the technology, which is, which is quite important in all that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Veronica Angel, uh, Europe's fellow. Um, I'm wondering where do you take this, uh, where do you extract this idea that the EU is um, a powerful in economic terms? Uh, the model of development that the um, European Union has been building it, itself on has mostly relied on cheap energy, outsourcing um, production to and using cheap labor, um, this is no longer congruent with the desire of, uh, you know, moving towards a more climate-friendly, um, um, sustainable um, economic model. So, um, among all the positive things that you mentioned, a few of you, including Rosa, has mentioned the, the EU's uh, economic potential, and um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on the sources of that. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Leonardo Vittori. I'm a geopolitical analyst and a former COE alumni. Um, since it has been uh, wonderfully and clearly explained by the, uh, the panel, I would like to uh, deepen one of the arguments that they presented before. So um, we saw in these past two years the disruption of supply chain. We saw how Europe is strictly, unfortunately, dependent um, uh, with uh, foreign, foreign countries that are not strictly democratic, such as China, for example. We saw even that 30% uh, of global supply uh, is, um, is passing through the Taiwan Strait, so it's strictly connected even more for China. So my question is to the panel, if um, this, this path of uh, separating ourselves from these countries such as China, India even, or the Southeast Asia, would be viable in the medium or long term? Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, since it seems like we are setting up an agenda for the EU, how far would the EU members actually board on this one? And how could we make uh, the EU strategies look more European as in the sense of its whole membership, and not just like French or German, as it often appears on the international stage? Thank you. Uh, 
thank you. Um, my name is Tracy Reid. I'm with the Australian Embassy. Um, and I'd like to explore a little bit more some of the questions that have already been made that I'd sort of describe more in the geoeconomics space around supply chain resilience and the uh, energy which has been discussed a lot. Um, and there's also increasing language on onshoring, nearshoring, friendshoring, um, as well as uh, uh, responses to things like the um, Inflation Reduction Act in, from the US. So there's, um, there are tensions even within what you might broadly call the West and the market economies. And um, I'd just be interested in to, to what extent is this just a rational, pragmatic response to what's going on, or whether um, these are setting up some longer term uh, uh, influences that may, you know, be, you know, for, for an economy like Australia's, we're a long way away from, from our partners and uh, just, just interested in where you think that might go. where I would start. Um, it is indeed true that because security has uh, changed its nature and has become a multi-dimensional uh, policy area, you cannot, you can any, you, you cannot, you can, you cannot separate uh, security policy from other policies any longer, or at least not to the extent you were, you were able to do uh, in, in years past, I mean, as, as Rosa said before, we, we, we need to, uh, we should learn to marry uh, various dimensions of uh, public policy into our single foreign policy uh, framework. It, it's, 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 quite, it's quite a difficult task. But again, from the, the point of view of the member states, more EU action makes sense in terms of defending their national interests. But it doesn't make sense to do everything at the EU level, uh, especially when it comes to hard security. And uh, this is very important that we, that we uh, um, uh, keep in mind. I mean, this idea about European uh, sovereignty or about even strategic autonomy, it was always a controversial notion. It, it main, its main problem was not so much that member states had different opinions, but it wasn't very much attached to reality. And this war has made it really, really clear that the reality is one of European dependence. European dependence on the United States. We depend on US arms. We now depend on US LNG supplies. We depend on the U.S. system of alliances because this war has uh, compelled the, the EU to reconfigure its energy supply away from Russia. Um, and most, not all, but most of the countries, EU member states have, um, have resorted to in order to replace Russian energy supplies are countries with strong ties with the United States. In addition, the war has widened the gap uh, between the US and its allies on the one hand and the rivals on the other hand, uh, including China. It has widened, therefore, the gap between the EU and China. And if you take all this together, you're going to see that for the EU to pursue separate policies from the United States on issues like Iran or China or anything else, it has become harder because the political rewards have decreased and the political incentives of alignment have increased. And the, 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 the key point this war has, has made clear is that we now have a strong structural driver towards more EU integration. And whether this is going to happen or not, I, I don't know. But the structural driver is very strong and EU leaders do recognize that. 
But more EU integration, which may happen, is not automatically the same thing as more EU autonomy. Because in a, in a, in a way, the, 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 uh, b because of the uh, unavoidable or uh, um, um, because the, 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 the transatlantic relationship remains uh, the fundamental security framework in which the European member states operate, and this is not going, this is not going to change for, I mean, however much EU member states will put into the energy defense, uh, into the European defense fund or any other mechanisms, this is not going to change at least for a, a few decades from a, from, from, from a few, uh, at least in the next few, few, few decades. Um, the point is that EU integration is and can be, is an effective and can be an even more effective sys uh, mechanism to organize intercontinental relations, relations inside the EU and in the wider Europe framework. But for as long as the United States is the one country on which we depend for all the reasons I mentioned before, we, um, I mean, European integration will remain a function of European dependence on the United States. So the, 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 the one thing that the world has changed is that with respect to the last 30 years, now European integration and, trans and European dependence on the US can actually go together in a mutually reinforcing way because by by European integration, uh, the Europeans can increase their contribution to their own defense, which is what the United States wants, because the United States doesn't want to leave Europe, just wants the Europeans to take on a, 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 a bigger share of the burden. Perhaps I'll take <clears throat> the question on, on resilience. So, um, as I mentioned in my points, <clears throat> it's, it's a must to increase uh, economic resilience of the European Union. And I think, um, you know, supply chains, European or transatlantic, so I, you know, focus here on, on the need to strengthen economic integration and coordination with the United States, need to be rebuilt to provide redundancy, uh, especially in areas of key national security sectors and also eliminate, uh, uh, as I mentioned, dependencies on China and Russia. Now, we live in a world, let's be realists here, we live in a world of great power competition, of strategic competition. If really the European Union wants to be an important player, it has to be a geopolitical player in this world. Now, economically, if you look at data, um, one of the losers, let's say, of globalization, uh, the way that it has worked in the past 20 years has been the European Union. The, the European Union economy has shrunk from 20% of the global economy 20 years ago, 25 years ago, to 15% of the global economy now. So um, I think um, um, also when it comes to you know, technological innovation that um, is driving nowadays geopolitical, uh, economic, and military competition all around the world. And in this case, it's the US and China that are leading the field, uh, while Europe is lagging behind in the global uh, tech race and actually faces an uphill battle uh, in its attempt to remain competitive. So European Union is not, countries are not really competitive when it comes to technological global race, and that is you know, losing competitiveness in the economies, uh, economy of the future. So these are all very uh, important elements that um, the European Union institutions and EU countries need to take uh, much more seriously. May I just mention something else? Um, so I think in, in the, um, what Ricardo mentioned before, it's the lack of you know, funding also financial resources in the European Union or lack of coordination. It's not that there are no financial resources there, but lack of coordination of those financial resources. So uh, just a couple of months ago, um, the European Commission came up with the global gateway strategy. So the European Union understand what needs to be done, but there is this gap between the narrative and the actions. So the global gateway strategy around 340 billion in order to increase uh, European Union's influence also in the world, and it's a counter, um, you know, as a counterbalance to Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, 
The problem is that we don't know how that's going to work out. We don't know how these projects will be implemented. We had another uh, strategy a few years ago, which was the European uh, strategy on um, uh, building infrastructure in Eurasia. It, that failed because it was good strategy on paper, a perfect one, uh, but it was not backed by funding. So that this is also very important going ahead. Okay, I, I'm going to build on what Val just mentioned, but also respond to uh, Gianni Silvestri's uh, comment, which I think is very important. And, and it's true that the EU was built for a world that's peaceful and multilateral and compromise-driven, but unfortunately, uh, this world doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> this is why we need, it's a geopolitical world, and this is why we need to be geopolitical. And incrementally, we've seen a change in the discourse and a change in our capability building as well. So, I mean, if we look at the 2003 strategy, the Javier Solana strategy, then it's all about effective multilateralism and all of that. Then we move to Mogherini's strategy, 2016, and it's more about principled pragmatism. And today we are less principled and more pragmatic. We do not have uh, an option. So I think uh, that doesn't mean that internally uh, we can't protect our model. I think it's extremely important that internally we consolidate our, our value-based uh, model because this is what is going to create the unity among uh, the Europeans and this is a way of projecting our power. But I'm not sure that we are still in a position to project the model that we have because if we are going to be honest, the EU approach has always been about exporting its model it has tried to do it in the Sahel, they kicked us out. It's trying to do it in, in the Western Balkans and, and it's failing. So, you know, I think we are at a moment where we need to be pragmatic. So if we are going to be pragmatic, then uh, and I'm going to be honest, I'm not sure that not having relations with China is going to be an option for the EU. Um, it has on some issues we are not going to be able to cooperate and on other issues we are not going to, to have a choice. You know, a, a few years back the U.S. had asked the EU not to trade with Iran. Um, that was uh, a plausible thing to do, but not to have relations with China uh, from the perspective of the EU, I think that will be extremely, extremely difficult. It can, uh, and should obviously diversify uh, its, its uh, partners. And I think that we are seeing um, the consequences of the sanctions that have been put in Russia in that we see that Russia is slowly withdrawing from poles of Africa where they had expanded. Uh, and also, you know, the EU and and I still want to talk about the EU as a, as a system rather than the member state. They, they, the EU could reinforce uh, its relations with its uh, neighbors, even its southern neighborhood. It's a natural area to have uh, relations with. And we should start from there and then maybe, I don't know, Central Asia. But there, there are possibilities of diversifying our, our partners. But not cutting out very important global Okay, I think ultimately the story is about managing Europe's decline. I mean, that is the story. And actually, we can expand that. It's about managing the West's decline. So how to do it in the best way? Um, some of the elements I think I've added on already, but let me just address uh, Veronica's question about you know, the sources of economic power. Um, if we look at the COVID times, the, the blocks that were able to access uh, resources to um, address the COVID pandemic, that was the US, China, and Europe. We saw how deep the pockets can be because we can mobilize you know, national, uh, in the EU's case, European funding, public debt, uh, but also access it on the, you know, from World Bank, international financial institutions. And that's 
a, a relative advantage by comparison to other parts of the world. Um, and I, that's why I was talking about investing on innovation, investing on the digital green transition. That is the economic model of the future. And I don't think Europe is that badly placed. However, it is placed in a space which, whether we like it or not, is tied to the United States because of security and because of the security dimension of technology and technological innovation. So that is a space where Europe, I think, is constrained. However, it's not necessarily constrained on a, another classic source of, EU, um, of the EU's economic power, which is commerce and trade. Um, and I think that's where you know, there will be a little bit more room for maneuver. I don't see the US, you know, the, EU, the US is making demands on Europeans and on other partners with respect to the relationship with China, but it's really focused on security and security of technology. It's not necessarily focused on you know, manufacturing, and uh, so that's another source. Um, but it does require something, and here, you know, this is where European member states have a real schizophrenic problem. It requires immigration. It requires people coming to Europe to work, uh, to work in the knowledge economy um, and to work in, in the economy more generally. And here, and I'm thinking this country in particular, but I mean plenty of others, have a real problem with opening borders for legal immigration. And that will be the, key, the other bit, because the demographics are not in favor of, um, of uh, Europe playing a, you know, an important role in, in, the, in the economy of the future. This work? I think it is. Oh, do I? This is this working? This is working. Okay. Um, no, I think it is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, welcome everybody to this panel. Can the European Union fix rule of law backsliding? Um, it is between. We are between lunch, so we will. Uh, jump right in so yes uh, i'm amanda coakley a senior staff reporter at coda story and a europe's futures fellow as well um, so i'd like to welcome everyone to this panel as we know europe has not been exempt from rule of law weakening and stagnation globally in hungary and poland for example violation of the rule of law has become one of the defining features of the political systems of fides and law and justice the EU response to the crises in these member states has waxed and waned, and now with a war in a neighbouring state, time and attention for this issue may be split. 
What is clear is that we need to approach the issue of rule, and, rule of law backsliding with nuance. So I'm delighted to introduce my three outstanding co-panellists who can do just that. Um, next to me is Julia de Klerk Stressa, Saxa. <laughs> I nearly got there. Um, my apologies. Um, Oana Popescu Zamfir and Veronica Ankel. Um, I'd like to welcome you all. So I think we're going to start with Oana. Um, if you would just like to try and answer the question of the panel for us, please. Thank you very much. Uh, is this working? Yes, it seems to be. Um, I, I will try to um, essentially make the point that um, to the question, can the EU prevent um, rule of law backsliding? The answer is yes, but not in the way that we've been used to thinking about it, um, or not only in that way. Um, and I will, to, to support that statement, I will use um, the, the research on the Democratic Resilience Index, which has been part of my, um, my Europe's Futures Fellowship at IWM um, and, and also um, together with my colleagues at the Global Focus Center in, in Bucharest. Um, and I will start by saying that until not long ago we've been used to looking at democratic transitions as being something linear. Um, all regimes were either authoritarian or on the way to becoming democratic or um, full-fledged or partial democracies. I think in the meantime, we have learned that some transitions uh, or some transitional democracies, as we used to um, regard them, never really make it to being um, democracies. Some have been backsliding and others swing back and forth across the spectrum. So there are many gray areas when we say democracy. Um, and, and the study of democracy has evolved from binary to taking into account a wide spectrum of potential political regimes. Now, the, the Democratic Resilience Index that we have worked on had two pilot waves, one on Romania, Hungary, and Moldova, uh, the other one that we've just launched on Austria, Poland, and Georgia. All of them very interesting, uh, given their very different circumstances and their very different evolutions over the past few years. What we have discovered, though, is, for instance, that in the first wave, Hungary, an, an EU and NATO member state, and Moldova, which is neither, are disturbingly close in terms of democratic resilience. Uh, the same can be said in the second wave about Georgia and Poland. Again, mind you, this is not about the quality of democracy. The quality of democracy is one thing, but when we speak about backsliding, we look at the sustainability of democracy, its resilience, so its capacity to either resist uh, backsliding or recover from it without major damage to the quality of democracy. So from that perspective, non-EU member states and member states, some of them can be, as I was saying, disturbingly close, um, even, even to uh, a country like Georgia, which has not even received, unlike Ukraine and Moldova, a European perspective yet because of its, uh, because of its shortcomings. Uh, that, that is not only true for Hungary and Poland, which we are used to looking at as examples of backsliding. This is also true to some extent of Austria. Um, Austria comes out of our analysis, which um, I, I should say, and, and, and sorry for not doing so earlier, um, the, the index that we have worked on has both a quantitative and qualitative analysis dimension. The quantitative analysis dimension looks at politics and governance, economic factors, external affairs, and media and civil society. It looks at these four dimensions across four, um, let's say, domains. Um, one is institutional structure, the other one is elite agency, and the other two are crisis triggers, 
So potential critical junctures that cannot necessarily be captured if you just look at the structural factors, which might, uh, which, which, which might um, let's say, announce potential uh, backsliding. And the, the, uh, the opposite, crisis buffers. So those um, antibodies, if you wish, that should something like that occur, have the capacity to prevent um, full backsliding. So from that um, perspective, if you look at Austria today, Austria comes out as a country with a strong democracy, uh, from, from the point of view of the quality of democracy, of course, largely based on institutional structure. So uh, this is not surprising that the country has had decades to institutionalize uh, this, uh, this quality of democracy, but with significant uh, crisis triggers, so prune to backsliding, and not very many buffers should that occur. What that tells us from the point of view of the interpretation of the data is that like other EU countries, we may have there a country with a strong democracy, which has, however, failed to invest, to continue to invest enough in its democratic, um, let's say, building, uh, precisely because it trusted that the quality of its democracy is entrenched enough. Um, but some of the some of the problems that we see that that uh, signal uh, potential problems are um, rising political corruption, the the renewed rise of the far right, anti-immigrant sentiments, the strong influence of Russia. If we look at external affairs, and since we are at the uh, at the um, uh, since we're referring to external affairs. And, and this very much links to what the EU can do. Um, this comes out of the study as a very strong buffer for all of the uh, countries that we have analyzed against democratic backsliding. So the, the fact that they are either EU members or aspiring to become members or have simply made a choice to, uh, to link their foreign policy to that of the EU and NATO and, and um, have alliances with the EU and NATO, that functions as a strong buffer irrespective of their domestic uh, context which might look the other ways, let's say. So since uh, mention was made of the Western Balkans earlier, that tells you something about enlargement and, and the potential for the EU to still act as a transformative power, whether more or less depending on its commitment to enlargement, but we can still see in a very quantitative and concrete way that alone this clear orientation of foreign policy, which reduces the influence of other external malign actors and introduces conditionalities that can be seen in the economic sector, that can be seen in the so uh, in the civil society sector and so on, these function as significant buffers. Um, we see this, for instance, we, we see that um, in the case of Poland and Georgia, um, both have uh, quite high crisis triggers, so they're quite prone to backsliding, but because of, uh, because of its status as an EU member state, Poland has significantly stronger uh, buffers. If we look at Georgia, though, we will see that um, it has, it, it scores more highly on buffers on the external affairs dimension than on any other dimension. So that is one of the things that's keeping it afloat at a time when it's facing significant challenges uh, domestically. The same can be seen, I think, uh, there is a correlation between the fact that Whereas Austria is a state with a long-standing democracy, relies mostly on the institutionalization of, of this democracy. When it comes to the newer member states or still non-member states of the EU, elite agency, so the way that people drive democratic transition is more significant. And we see this also um, 
again, if we look at Georgia, at the level of institutions, where a few of these, driven by uh, people who are committed to democracy, have the potential to function as buffers. Again, I repeat, Georgia is today in a situation where it has um, a party that's run by an oligarch from behind the shadows. And so um, it, it is really in a state of state capture, I guess I could define it, uh, which prevents it from uh, moving closer to the EU. However, we have institutions like the Public Defender's Office, the State Audit Office, the State Inspector's Office till 2021, a few municipalities uh, where, again, it's the elite agency and the desire to come closer to the EU that's actually uh, managed to uh, keep away some, some of that backsliding. Um, I think we should also, yes. Um, Coming to, coming to a close, um, I, I would also mention one very significant thing. If we look at Poland, again, because it's so often quoted as an example, um, what's, been what's been driving its backsliding is the legal and judiciary uh, reform. The same can be said, I think, to a large extent by Hungary. So the institutions are the first ones that are being attacked, the institutions that are responsible for rule of law. However, you have defenders of the rule of law and you have buffers against backsliding in very, or perhaps not very unexpected um, places. But um, the first wave of our um, study showed, for instance, in all the countries analyzed, low levels of political activism, so people vote less, but very high levels of public and civic participation. So what happens is that you have civil society encouraged and developed with EU help, by the way, where people want to make a contribution. They actually, they're eager to participate in democratic life. They just don't do it within the traditional institutions of representative democracy because the political institutions don't allow them that space for, uh, for active participation. But they are trying to do it. The same uh, in the case of Poland, the fact that Poland is a very decentralized state. And why? Because of the economic development, among other things, which is coming with EU accession. Uh, that allows for multiple power centers, which can challenge sometimes the central leadership. So all of these things, not to mention civil society, and I can get into uh, more of that later, are very strong buffers against democratic backsliding which unfortunately the EU has largely ignored uh, not just within and, and among its member states but also uh, in the Western Balkans, again to, to return to the example, where the EU has worked mostly with the regimes and has ended up propping up regimes that had lost legitimacy in the eyes of their own people, whereas the actual drivers of democratization within civil society and the business sector for instance, have been uh, largely ignored. So um, just to conclude again, yes, there, is, there are many ways through which the EU can encourage uh, the development of rule of law and, and prevent backsliding, just not necessarily the ones that it has activated so far. Thank you so much, Awana, for that. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to move on straight to Veronica. Do you think the EU can solve the issue of uh, rule of law backsliding. Thank you, Amanda. As a full disclaimer for our audience, you mentioned uh, now that we're supposed to have nuances, but you prepared us for this uh, panel um, uh, by telling us we need to have a yes and or no answer. So I'm, I'm really grateful to uh, Juana for having uh, brought in the nuance. I'm going to get here. <laughs> I'm going to deal so with the other part. We want it all here. We want it all. I'm going to deal with the other part and, uh, and be less nuanced and, and respect your initial prompt. So um, uh, uh, that would be, can the EU fix uh, rule of law uh, backsliding? My answer is no. The EU cannot uh, fix rule of law backsliding um, because that will mostly rest with member states and ultimately with the people um, in these member states. And in many ways, um, um, 
Juana's and her team's effort to build this index is, is, quite, um, is quite remarkable, but it also looks at member states and shows that the EU um, has either an enabler role um, or it has um, uh, the ability to, to be constraining. Um, and in that way, the EU is actually quite predictable at doing things pathway um, and, um, and managing to be um, not exactly a, a visionary um, in terms of, of uh, preserving the standards for democracy. Um, and uh, that's the, um, it's just a reality in which we, we have to, to, to live in. Um, at this point. There are absolutely no signs that this will change going, uh, going further. So, um, and, and I'm saying that for three major reasons. Uh, it's because of what we see, because we pay attention, because of what we don't see, because we don't pay attention, and because of what we don't want to see. So reasons in the first category, the things that we see because we pay so much attention, right? It's uh, what's happening in, in Hungary um, and Poland, um, and we've all become more or less experts in Polish constitutionalism um, <laughs> in, in the last years. Um, but what we don't talk about is the fact that the changes that they have made in the last years because of slow responses are irreversible. Uh, the um, uh, much contested National Council of the Judiciary uh, has uh, um, nominated, so, so has appointed or promoted more than 2,000 judges. These judges, in their contested way, have also delivered uh, further judgments, right? So the whole judiciary process of Poland in the last year um, has been overhauled in ways that it cannot be reversed. And it's the same in, in uh, Hungary. The changes that the, the Fidesz majority um, has brought up um, um, are so profound, and not just in terms of how uh, public procurement is distributed and so on, but it constitutional changes, important changes that will not be um, uh, easily um, brought back. They can't just be rolled back. So they will be there no matter who wins um, uh, the elections in Poland next year, um, or if something were to happen to Fidesz, which doesn't seem to be the case um, right now. So these are the things that, that, we, uh, that we see. What we don't see, and this is um, again um, a credit to Juana and her team for pointing to other countries um, uh, that are experiencing these different challenges, um, but uh, we, we, so because we don't talk about it, right? I don't know how many of you know that Romania for the past year has been ruled uh, with the Prime Minister who um, is the uh, f former Chief of the Joint Staff, so an ex-general of the, of, of the Army um, uh, who has um, put all military types in the government um, and uh, has completely um, halted any kind of reform. So the country is stagnating on multiple dimensions um, including the possibility of in bringing in people who uh, might see things in ev any different way um, uh, than the military types that are now uh, staffing um, uh, the European government. So we're, this attention is limited, of course. Um, and then you have Bulgaria that can't manage to um, organize its own, its own cabinets. And of course, at the same time, you have s stagnation, right, because you can't um, uh, get these things uh, straight and we can go into the details of how uh, uh, Romania, for example, uh, but also Italy, this, this own, I mean, country we're in, um, has exited the pandemic with a strengthened executive that now it's being ruled by people whose intentions related to um, uh, high standards of democracy are not particularly clear. Uh, and we are very happy that Meloni doesn't seem to be um, as anti-European as we had feared and so on at the level of the rhetoric, but she's discussing a constitutional change um, that doesn't necessarily have to be bad, but are we sure that these are the right people to enact constitutional change right now in Italy? So these are, let's say, the category of the things that we don't uh, uh, maybe pay attention uh, that much to. And the things that we really, really don't want to see um, are connected to this idiosyncratic or maybe just kind of cognitive dissonance um, that we have at the European level uh, to be at the same time in cooperation and in competition uh, with authoritarian regimes. So in, in this 
um, realm, the Americans have been uh, a bit, I mean, they've been better at shaping the conversation as democracy versus um, autocracy, but we don't give them a lot of credit for that because they also have internal reasons to, um, internal politics reasons uh, to shape the conversation in that way. Um, and also, you know, it's America, so their credibility when it comes to democracy is not very high either. Um, but that is where the European Union would have an advantage. Um, and we were talking about the uh, advantages that the European Union can have in the previous panel, and I don't see a lot of optimism there. Of course, we can look for it, but there isn't a lot of room for optimism. The thing that the European Union has is capital when it comes to, uh, you know, there's a safe place um, uh, to conduct business, it's uh, more or less stable, um, and those things are also based on the fact that it's a, a democratic or it's a first mover uh, on issues of democracy. In the moment that we become more and more pragmatic in these terms, um, that is when the major asset that the European Union has is being compromised. So the strategy of co-optation uh, of authoritarian regimes by not even mentioning um, authoritarianism in their strategic compass right now. So I don't know if you've read it, but what it says is that the EU will have to deal with competing governance systems. What is that? I mean, seriously, I can imagine a lot of staffers going back and like, we won't say authoritarian, we won't say liberals, we won't say, we'll say competing governance systems. This is the strategy for the European Union. So it's really a, a, a difficult position um, and, it, um, and it's, it seems like it's a, more or less a losing game because of the lack of vision um, at this point. Oh. <laughs> right, so with that, brava, thank you. <laughs> <I will. laughs> thank you, thank you very, very much. And now, straight across to Julia, same question. Thanks so much, Amanda, and um, thanks also to Veronica and Luana for some great remarks, which I hope to build on. Um, now, those of you who know me and who know my work in the context of this fellowship know that I'm, as a former speechwriter, partial to tripartite structures. So I'm going to look at this question, and I'm just going to answer, and I will, a yes Don't or no worry. question. Um, but I'll look at three dimensions of this, so the what of the question, the why, and the how. Mm -hmm. um, fixing democratic backsliding. So can the EU fix democratic um, backsliding? I would swing the pendulum back to the beginning and say, yes, it can. But as a good, also having been trained in the, in the French academic system and taught at Sciences Po uh, in the manner of thèse, antithèse, synthèse, I'd say, yes, it can in cooperation with the national uh, societal, political, and economic actors. So that's crucial. Um, as we've seen also in the, in the previous panel, when it comes to dem democracy promotion or fixing democratic backsliding externally, outside actors, democratic change in, in general cannot be imposed from the outside if it doesn't work. I think we've learned that um, in, in many examples. Um, but what the EU can do is it can develop a framework and tools that help actors inside the country to prevent um, backsliding and um, in doing so in a way it can help others help themselves if you will. It should also avoid and uh, to inadvertently support those inside the country that are actually promoting the backsliding <coughs> and I guess corruption and EU funding is, is a kind of point in case uh, in, in that. Um, now why should the European Union fixed democratic backsliding, and and in particular in this time, Amanda, you, you uh, kind of referred to that at the outset. Um, I think it should now, it has every interest to do so, and especially now, mm -hmm. even if it makes it more tricky, the context, but I think especially now, um, because it undermines backsliding within the EU, undermines its credibility, its legit legitimacy, um, as, as, a, as a normative power, as upholding the, the norms that it's enshrined in its treaties, but I would say it, it undermines the European Union full stop. Um, <coughs> we've also seen that, and some of the speakers in the previous panel have, uh, have referred to that. Um, 
um, that democratic coherence inside the union makes the union stronger as a, as a unitary actor and also, of course, increases its legitimacy um, and its credibility abroad. Uh, so I think it has every, act, every interest to do that. Um, it's a security interest as well. Again, we live in an era of geopolitical competition. If you are not unitary, if you are not coherent as a political actor, um, you cannot take decisions. Again, we're seeing that right now. Um, you are vulnerable. Um, if, if, you, if there's no free speech, you're vulnerable to disinformation, something that's totally spiraled out of control in the past years. If you are corrupt, you're not only you know, a problematic internal governance, but also, of course, again, you're, you're vulnerable to outside interference. And again, we've seen how economic influence plays a huge factor in weakening the, the European Union. Um, if you don't have proper rule of law, again, you're not coherent, you, you can't make, make decisions um, effectively. Um, and then lastly, maybe the, the how of, of the question. I, I know that's a, a panel in itself, mm -hmm. we can probably come back to that within, within the discussion as well, but maybe two things that I'd like to pick out on. Um, first of all, decentralization. And I think both Oana and Veronica have already mentioned that the crucial role of civil society. So it's important when it comes to EU funding and also withholding EU funding that when you give money and support that you give it directly to civil society actors, to those actors within the system that are actually upholding democracy and the rule of law. Now, one of the risks I already pointed out is that you inadvertently give money to those that are actively undermining the system. The, the other side of the coin, of course, is also you might inadvertently stop giving support to those actors that are upholding and fighting back against democratic backsliding. So I think that's something in looking at sort of EU tools of, of support and, and, and sanctions mechanisms uh, that's really important. I think the other thing that's really crucial is consistency. So who do you pick out and not? Of course, it's important to pick the, the biggest offender and um, first and address that, but I think it needs to be very clear that whoever is backsliding, that there is a, a consequence, that you don't pick out one or two countries and kind of set them as examples and others don't get addressed because that absolutely then delegitimizes the system and again also weaponizes those regimes in those countries that are being picked out to say this is scapegoating or witch hunt or whatever. So you really need to be sure to also be consistent in, in addressing, and again, Europe is facing democratic backsliding, as, as many of you said, across the board in many, many countries, not just a, a few that we keep talking about. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, and, and thank you all. I think we've had such a depth uh, to the answer. Everyone has had a yes or a no, and some nuance as well. So um, we're, we're on, wet, wet, well on the road. Um, so I just wanted to then just ask one question very briefly before we throw it open to the floor. Has Russia's invasion of Ukraine been a distraction from combating rule of law backsliding in the EU? And I'd like to start again with Iwana. Yes and no, again. <laughs> uh, yes, in the sense that um, I, I think, and, and this is to continue uh, Julia's um, words of, of a bit earlier. Um, I think the EU has also managed to bury itself very deep in its own claims to perfection um, when it comes to um, the quality of democracy and what the EU can do for democracy and how it acts in accordance with its uh, democratic standards or not. And now it's finding it really hard to marry that with geopolitical considerations mm -hmm. because geopolitical considerations acknowledge the fact that you have your own interest um, which may or may not have much to do with uh, democracy. Surely, um, as the, the, you know, the, the, um, the umbrella concept is that in this global competition um, between autocratic system and democratic systems, we stand for the democratic systems and, and that's what we fight for, but sometimes the means to the end are not necessarily 100% democratic. And we really have trouble acknowledging that or reconciling that um, with, with, uh, with our claims and we don't really know where to draw the line. 
So if you, if you only look at the decision um, made with respect to Ukraine and Moldova and giving them the, the EU perspective, um, that really didn't happen because Ukraine and Moldova finally um, fulfilled criteria that they didn't uh, you know, a few years ago. Uh, this was a geopolitical decision. Was it a smart thing to do? Well, yes, and, and very likely it's something that should have been done even a few years ago. Um, but we were extremely strict as the EU on our criteria then, and we're not as strict now. Uh, if, you, if you look at the Western Balkans, the, the opposite happened. North Macedonia fulfills the criteria uh, and also you know, makes historic sacrifices, and still uh, there is no opening of the negotiations because the EU itself um, is, is too, uh, too deep in, in, its own, uh, uh, in its own crisis. Um, same, same kind of geopolitical decision, if you wish, very recently on the European Commission recommending uh, the lifting of the cooperation and verification mechanism for Romania, uh, essentially to overcome the Netherlands' opposition to Schengen accession, uh, because the Netherlands was connecting Schengen accession with the existence of the CVM. This was not because Romania is now, uh, has, has implemented uh, rule of law reforms, which it didn't uh, do a few years ago. Quite on, on the contrary, as Veronica was rightly pointing out, um, this was again a geopolitical decision. Again, should it have been made sooner, when, by the way, Romania was already fulfilling the criteria anyway? Yes, absolutely, but it, but it wasn't. So, um, essentially, the, the war on our borders has made us try to think geopolitically, but I, didn't, I, I don't think that we have come to, to an agreement amongst ourselves um, or, or even the, the member states themselves as to how, how we're gonna reconcile that with rule of law, with democratic standards, while at the same time we realize that this is really a, a, a double contest on the one hand, it's pure geopolitics, it's a competition for power and influence, but that clearly overlaps with the competition for values and for, for systems of governance. So um, I, I think you know, the EU is going to be a much more relevant geopolitical actor when it comes to understand how it, it aims to marry the two uh, and be coherent about it, which really hasn't been the case until now. Thank you, thank, thank you so much. And Veronica, your thoughts? Thank you. Uh, my answer is no, not particularly. Um, the EU has what was always quite distracted when it came to rule of law, so probably these are just degrees of distraction, if uh, we can put it that way. Um, uh, in re I mean, the reality is that the, the standards for um, rule of law have been set so low by Hungary, uh, particularly in Poland right now, that we are just happy that you know Croatia isn't doing that bad, so maybe <laughs> they should be in the Euro and in Schengen, uh, but not Romania or Bulgaria for reasons. Um, so um, this is just, um, it, it's clearly, there's no, um, clear strategy of, about what to do um, uh, here, even in the context um, of the war. And um, the idea of the, of the CVM being connected to this, I think that just lifting the CVM for Romania, which they have already done in 2019 for Bulgaria, it's an acknowledgement that the CVM never had actual effects. Um, and it's also an acknowledgement that it's okay, let's just get it done with. Um, but also because there is this um, rule of law um, cycle that uh, is the actual, it's the first motivation for lifting the CVM for Romania. We don't need it because we're now analyzing everybody and we've um, kind of as increased the uh, attention to, to everyone. So there's absolutely no acknowledgement of any kind of, um, of, of movements going forward. Um, it's just an acknowledgement of, uh, you know, we, yeah, we're gonna keep being, um, uh, distracted on this point, um, and the simple extend so extending in in large um, candidate status to Ukraine and Moldova 
um, in, in my view, is a confirmation that the enlargement is a peacekeeping and stability mechanism. Enlargement will not take place. I don't know why we're not saying this. Uh, in, in the sense that we imagine it with a full veto powers, this will not happen. Again, they could not agree to let uh, Romania and Bulgaria inside Schengen, which is okay. It's a big deal, but it's not really that big of a deal. Schengen is also doesn't function, right? In, in Austria puts up borders with Italy because Italy can't control its own borders um, all the time without be it being legal, right? So you can't just put uh, borders with member states just like that. Um, you need a serious reasons and you can't do it for a long period of time. But Austria does it uh, on occasion. So Austria vetoed also uh, the membership of these states into Schengen. So enlargement will, they will use any kind of reasons to uh, delay it. it will, it's not credible. They, there's no um, uh, reason to believe that um, um, uh, this, is a, is, this is part of, of trying to ignore more or less uh, a rule of law because there was already quite, uh, quite an important distraction uh, away from it. COVID and how states dealt with COVID and with public procurement and uh, networks of corruption with, uh, that were established during COVID as well um, um, were a more prominent um, uh, source of, of distraction, to, to keep using that, um, that word, um, uh, than the Russia-Ukraine war when it comes to, to the rule of law. Thank you very much. Andrea. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I would also pick a nuanced <laughs> answer this time. Um, distraction, yeah, we can talk about how focused has the European Union been in, in, in the first place on this issue, and I think that's a, a very good point. Um, has the war then distracted the European Union from doing something? I, I would maybe rephrase and say if, if you're asking have considerations about addressing rule of law backsliding and speaking out on it mm -hmm. um, strongly affect has the consideration of staying coherent in having unity in addressing uh, Russian aggression and, and helping Ukraine. I think yes, absolutely. I think that has been a factor that uh, there were worries that the European Union will not be capable of taking united decision making if, if it pushes too hard, so certain member states too hard. And it, was that a good consideration? Well, th that's open to question, seeing what, what's happening right now, right? So is that a, a short-sighted or a long-sighted uh, um, issue, I think, um, is another question. I think the other thing, though, is that, of course, the wars also put the spotlight on why it's so important to address democratic backsliding in the first place within the European Union and, as, as many of you have stressed also in the previous panel, in the Europeans' neighborhoods. So it's actually mm -hmm. showing, again, that we need to keep the focus on this. And uh, Juana, you said this very nicely, this kind of double competition, right? And double, it's a competition for power and influence, but it's also a competition for systems and for the European Union for what it is and what it promotes. These two are married and it will keep thinking geopolitically will mean doing these two things together. It's, you cannot separate these two. And I think every country, including the United States, is seeing that right now. And, and so this is, this is really the key question that the European Union needs to answer for it. For itself, and that's that's a tricky one as we're as we're discovering. Thank you so much. Um, so I think we're ready to to throw it open to the floor. Um, we welcome questions and comments, but if it is a comment, please keep it short and just have a think before you lunge into the comment. Um, so uh, Heather. And we'll just do maybe three, and then I think we'll have time for another three. Thanks. Um, two observations uh, with questions for the panel. So uh, the rule of law issue highlights very much how the EU really operates as an economic system and as a political system. And the rule, rule of law issue really plays into um, what we've seen over the past 10 years. 
um, into those systems very much. So I think one thing to bear in mind is that as an economic system, uh, the EU's single market is very deeply undermined by differences in the application of EU law across different member states. Um, and that's a kind of collective public good which no one government wants to address, but which is very fundamental to making the system work. And in a way, that's almost a separate issue from the question of democracy, because even non-democratic economic systems like China, for example, have a very deep need for rule of law in order to ensure enforcement of contract, to ensure predictability for business actors. So I, I think it's very helpful the way Oana's project has uh, looked very systematically across elements of democratic backsliding, but I would actually draw a distinction between the democracy element and rule of law in its own right, also as a factor for the EU's economic system. And also, given how the, the paucity of EU law, particularly secondary legislation, addressing rule of law, the lack of standards for what, what constitutes it and its constitutive elements from, from um, freedom of the courts uh, through to enforcement of contract, um, the outsourcing of those standards to, for example, the Council of Europe is really problematic for the single market. Um, so is, I'm interested to know, Anna, in, in terms of your study, how you've addressed that, that question. Um, and the second one is uh, just today's decision on um, taking away part of, and really quite a small part, of Hungary's um, funding at EU level. So the very first use of the rule of law conditionality mechanism has been, we've seen that today, that's the breaking news this morning. Um, but the whole decision in, and the horse trading um, at the highest political level with Orban having the final sign off on the deal shows how much the EU as a political system is controlled on this issue by the member states. The lack of an independent institution to look at rule of law, for example, having some kind of extra chamber of the Court of Justice or many other ideas uh, that have been put forward over the years. Ultimately, this ends up being a political deal between heads of state and government, and they are very reluctant to call one of their own to account. It's still a gentleman's club um, in terms of the political dynamics on rule of law, even though it has these deep economic as well as democratic implications. Now, I think that also undermines the EU's uh, role as a geopolitical actor, and as Rosa pointed out in the last session, um, the EU is far from being a unitary actor, but it undermines it even more. And not only because uh, it's difficult, it, you know, Putin can take um, a gamble on whether EU unity will hold because it is so much controlled by the member states, but also um, the very fact that Orban has, has used, he's taken hostage EU aid to Ukraine um, on this very issue of rule of law. So I'm curious to know what you think about that. I've noticed how other member states are getting really annoyed with Orban now. He's lost a lot of allies, uh, those in the council who um, previously were prepared to turn a blind eye or even excuse his behavior. He's lost those. He's really quite isolated. And yet, he still gets a portion of the money. So might the war in Ukraine and as things, or right, Russia's war, and as things become even hotter geopolitically, could that cause um, in the future, more pressure because he's holding up the EU's ability to act. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Christoph down the back and then this gentleman here. Just back there. Oh, did you? Sorry. No, no you, you'll, be, you'll be first in the next round. Uh, thank you. Uh, Christoph uh, Bender, I'm with ESI and I'm also one of these uh, European Futures Fellows. Um, I think... Um, <laughs> with the thing. <laughs> um, I, I, I think you have a strong point that we have uh, real difficulties with uh, kind of the current mechanisms to try to kind of prevent backsliding in the area of the rule of law. I think essentially it's because they all eventually depend on a, on a decision in the Council. And the Council is not a body for such decisions. It's the EU member states. Uh, all of them are reluctant to actually piss off other member states. So kind of it's a, it's a body of actually finding consensus. And that's, I think, the reason why it's very difficult to find uh, uh, decisions there. I mean, we have the slight exception of Hungary now, but we have been seeing how, how difficult this was to uh, 
to, to, to get to, and it was a compromise, it was significantly lower than what the Commission uh, proposed, and I don't see this happening very often. I also don't see it happening for Poland, particularly now against the backdrop of Poland situation uh, uh, or frontline kind of status with in uh, the war in, in Ukraine. But I think we have actually another way which would be much more promising, you know, going through the Commission and the Court, and we sort of eliminate this level of political decision making. You can basically have infringement procedures on rule of law issues. The Commission has filed many of those uh, with regard to, uh, to Poland. And then, okay, there's this back and forth, and eventually, if the country is not complying, the Commission can go to court. And then, if the country still doesn't comply, the Commission, and that's quite crucial, can go back to the court to ask for a fine. Uh, now, what has been usual in infringement procedures, you know, there's a fine of, first of all, it happens very rarely, and it's, you know, it's 20 millions, it's 5 million, it's 40 millions, you know, it's peanuts, basically. But when we look at, you know, Google has to pay billions, you know, because of some competition issues. So we can make a, a very clear case if a country basically undermines uh, the, the rule of law in a way that it disrespects uh, rulings of the European Court of Justice related to the rule of law, that this is a threat to the union as such. And so why not basically impose just much, much, much bigger fines? And the interesting thing here is, um, it's very interesting, that there is actually no limitation. The, 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 the court can impose whatever it wants. Yeah? And I think the court has also been signaling that it would be actually willing to do so. The one key thing which has to happen is that it cannot do this if the commission doesn't go back to the court and asks for a fine. Yeah? That's the crucial thing. And I think we have been actually pretty close to this with regard of Poland. Then, I mean, the war in Ukraine, or the Russian invasion started, which made things more difficult. But I think this is potentially a, a, a much, much, much more potent way of fighting uh, the backsliding of rule of law in EU member states. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ivana. You're welcome. Thank you. Ivana Dragicevic, Europe Futures Fellow. I have a pick-up question for Veronica. Um, you've said, you've answered very clearly no. Uh, and you've argumented it with the cases of uh, Poland and Hungary, especially, you know, the institutional changes uh, in judiciary, for example. So if we have a situation that these things happen, that, you know, new laws are being voted upon in these countries, new values being developed or articulated out in the public as the values that are also European values. Uh, and they create new realities and parties like this are being voted and put into power in various European countries. So what can be our end game? Can we have this new Europe with, with new values or is it too uh, early to talk about that because we hear the drums of this new political uh, uh, um, I don't know, actors in Europe uh, that we heard already across the Atlantic talking about these new values. Thank you. Thank you. Do you still have a question? Or yeah. Just... Uh, thank you. Yeah. And just um, try, we're just coming up to the yes, last 10 minutes. Uh, um, the I, I have to quick questions. First, Luana, um, you have any data about Italy? Because I was, was interested in uh, hearing what the buffers are. And Veronica, uh, I was a bit taken aback by your kind of dark determinism uh, according to which the situation in Poland and Hungary is irreversible and the enlargement to Ukraine will never happen. You really don't see it. Anything that can, that can, okay. Uh, so that was that question. No, okay. So, <laughs> okay. I don't know what the question was. So perhaps was. the other <laughs> finalists can <laughs> cheer us up. I mean, you, you said that there is a kind of resistance inside of Hungary and Poland, for instance, and perhaps you, 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 you can tell us a bit about that in order to, to cheer me up at least, because I'm <laughs> she really depressed me. I want to kill you. Yeah. Awana, do you want to jump in? You've had two, you've had four questions from two people, so if you want to uh, 
to make way with that? Sure, uh, I, I, I tried to give this European answer very confusing and kind of uh, mixing them all together. Um, but let me start by cheering you up, um, <laughs> um, because I, I, I see that's pressing. Um, um, I mean, um, all, one of the things that we, uh, that the qualitative analysis in our instrument has is something that Karolina Wigura, our, um, the sociologist from Poland who has uh, um, worked with us on, on Poland, uh, defines as onset resilience as opposed to breakdown resilience. Um, onset resilience is the capacity to um, rever resist and revert to the initial point quite immediately after the backsliding occurs, before any major damage happens. Um, breakdown resilience is the capacity to resist further resilience once anti-democratic um, uh, trends have already materialized. I think in, in, in Poland, more than in Hungary, but to some extent in both, we do have breakdown resilience, rather, so, uh, and, and when it comes to Poland, um, and we can get into details later if you wish, um, there are multiple elements, including the experience with discontinuity, uh, the, uh, which means historically Poland, for instance, has been used to anything from foreign invasions to uh, fracturing as a state and so on and so forth. So people are actually rather resilient to crisis and they, they develop something that might seem contrary to rule of law, which is mechanisms to resist outside the formal structures. Um, so actually below the surface and, and what we see at an institutionalized level, in Poland at least, there are resilience mechanisms developing at the level of the wider society that do give us hope for this kind of breakdown resilience. So for Poland at some point, um, reversing the trend. But that being said, um, the, the unfortunate thing, because I, I cannot cheer you up all the way, um, is that um, autocrats also learn. And I think that's something we have, that we have seen with Orban and others. And, and I will give you the example of Romania which has managed in 2019 after um, something like two years of intense attacks on rule of law very specifically. So the attempt by the social democrat government of the time to reverse pretty much all significant uh, rule of law reforms. Romania has seen massive street protests and then eventually the ousting of that government in the most democratic fashion at the polls, uh, starting with the European elections and then continuing with all the others. However, what the, what the mainstream parties have learned from that is that if you try to launch a full-on attack on democracy, there might be opposition from the wider society. But if you do that incrementally, if you do that one day at a time, one measure at a time, in a very legalistic fashion, uh, and if you manage to embed that also in parliamentary processes, which seem consultative and representative, then there's going to be very little opposition. And that's where, unfortunately, we are in Romania now, where there's zero political opposition, other than from the, the Nationalist Party. Um, and the mainstream parties um, have a marriage of convenience that's based on sharing public money. Uh, so anything, everything that's contrary to rule of law. Um, I will go back and very briefly address the issue of uh, the economy. Uh, yes, we have that. I, I didn't go too much into that because uh, resilience, economic resilience or resilience per se, as you pointed out, is different from democratic resilience. Much of Southeast Asia, for instance, has very strong um, economic resilience. It's not necessarily of a democratic nature. But we, we do look at things like uh, M, um, FDI uh, from countries that have uh, like-minded democratic systems or countries that have um, um, systems that are based on other values, dispute resolution, regulation, and so on and so forth. So uh, that is absolutely the case. Um, I will say um, also about the, the uh, Christoph's comment on, 
on on how uh, this could be addressed for member states. Um, I, th I think you're absolutely correct, and, and um, this is something, for instance, that we see um, right now with um, Romania is, is considering going to the European Court of Justice uh, over the Austrian veto for Schengen accession. Uh, that has nothing to do with rule of law, but it's basically trying to appeal to a non-political uh, European entity. Um, but the problem that I see is that eventually everything is political and everything is intergovernmental. So there might be a lot of reluctance from member states to take this technocratic approach because there will be backlash from... The Commission is in, in the same position. Um, I mean, essentially, I, I think what, what holds back the, the EU and, and the functionality of, of, uh, of its bodies is the fear that, that that's going to break the consensus. The, the Commission knows that it will need consensus for the next issue and for the next issue. And if it manages to step on some toes, then what are those mem the member states going to do when it needs their support? So. I, I, I don't know how to break this deadlock, uh, but I think I essentially the EU doesn't know how to solve its political problem, and I'm not sure that there's a technocratic uh, response to it. Um, and have I left anything out? Um, no, I, I, I'm the, the, only, the only thing uh, I would add um, is that overall, I, I, I think we really have learned that EU consensus is really as good as, as our belief in it. And that's what I feel has, has shifted over the past few years following the example of Orban and, and uh, PIS in Poland, which is the realization by some member states, by, by more and more member states, um, that you can contribute to consensus and be constructive, or when it suits your needs, there are many ways that you can block consensus and, and use that veto power at all times to, to shift things in your uh, direction. And so I think that's, uh, that that is a, a problem that we'll need to overcome. Um, and uh, last of all, no, I don't have data for Italy uh, because this has only been a pilot project for six states, but we hope to very soon launch it in all of the other EU member states. Thank you so much. I just want to very quickly, we're just on time at one o'clock, but I just want to quickly go to Julia if you have any thoughts. Do you have any thoughts on the questions? And then we'll go straight to Veronica then. Sure. <coughs> just to pick up maybe um, on a couple of comments um, that were made, and, and thanks to the audience to actually help us solve the question rather than just adding and piling on, on more <laughs> questions to a already difficult issue. Heather, your point on um, economics, just, just to, and, and rule of law and markets, um, to second Anna as well, I think it's really important issue um, and I think it's a factor that will play a bigger role as well given the economic situation that also many member states are in and so I think it's, it's something to, to look at um, for sure when we look at um, rule of law backsliding as well. On your other issue of the catch-22, I mean yeah that's at the heart of the issue right so you have um, backsliding on rule of law, you need to uh, address that within um, with your member states, but you need the member states to address it, and of course that then makes you vulnerable to, to hostage taking, which, which we're seeing right now. Um, sitting where I'm sitting in Brussels, I would also say, yeah, I think we're now at a point where member states really are um, not just very upset, but they're also seeing the, the reverse side of the logic that you just showed, Juana, where you're like, well, you can, you, know, you can build consensus, but you can also undermine it and play it to your favor. But you're actually seeing, actually, it's not to our favor because it's really, we're really undermining ourselves, and now we've really got ourselves into a very, very tough situation. Uh, in a geopolitical context, again, that is very, very adverse and complicated. So I, do I have a sort of you know, immediate solution to that? No, but I would say the political will to really look at that and to, to find ways whether political or technocratic to better address this, I think it is much higher now. And that's maybe also to your follow-up question, you know, people are less, maybe a little bit less distracted uh, on, the, on the backsliding uh, issue, just to finish on a, on a silver lining there. 
Thank you so much. And then, Veronica, just the questions to you. All right, sources of hope. <laughs> <laughs> Stopped raining. Is that good? Uh, I didn't know that was part of our jobs, but okay, here goes. Sources of hope, having less competent uh, autocrats, which is why um, um, I'm, I'm worried that uh, Meloni is in charge and not Salvini. I would take a less competent one uh, um, if I could. Um, another source of hope comes from uh, our analysis of values, and this goes back to Ivana's um, question. Uh, we tend to oversample um, um, in terms of what is mm, bad, right? So the people that are not, they don't have new values, but they um, um, have extreme traditional values from their perspective um, that are no longer congruent with the standards of human rights uh, that the, let's say, the elite, uh, some parts of the elite um, uh, has um, um, developed. Um, but on average, even the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, in all studies of political behavior, attitudes, um, nationalism, um, outgroup hostility, and other such uh, things that we also analyze as political scientists, um, there has been a constant improvement from the 1990s. So there isn't, there isn't an overall bad news that comes at the level of the population. Most of the bad news come from how the elites choose to uh, manipulate um, a very vocal part of the population. So there's no, um, no, there isn't that much bad news at the level of the population as we would think um, that there is. And we can talk more about that. And the last source of hope, enlargement, I didn't say that it won't happen. It would say, I said that it won't happen in the way that we understand enlargement now. So, um, but if you think about it, the EU did move to include countries like Romania and, and, and Hungary uh, at a time when, um, and Bulgaria and others. So they were quite optimistic uh, a while back. That won't happen in the same way. There, there are ways to to deal with this, um, but it just it it won't look in the way that we imagine enlargement to look. Okay, thank you everybody. It is uh, now five past one. Thank you for sticking with us. Lunch is at the back of the room. I'd like to thank my panelists and everyone who asked a comment or question. Thank you.